in Libya and returned to Burkina Faso, something happened. Thomas Sankara was overthrown and killed. What do you know about it? Who were those who participated? Well, <clears throat> as I said uh, earlier, we were in groups. We entered in groups. We went to uh, Libya through Burkina Faso. I was in a 22 groups, 22 men group. And we passed through Burkina Faso smoothly. When we passed through Burkina, Thomas Akara was still president of Burkina Faso. And we went on to Libya. And all, all our group at the rear, the following groups, like the 47 men group, they were in Ouagadougou also for quite a long time. And the, the, the 36 men group and the 37 men group, we came by stages and the groups that went. But with my group, by the time we passed through Ouagadougou, Tama Sankara was still the president of Burkina Faso. Except for those who were in the group by the rear. There were a lot of groups and everybody stayed there for some time. Some people stayed two weeks, some people stayed two months before joining us in Libya. Or waiting for their flight to come back to Tajira camp to join us. It is said, it is said that uh, after you people have taken training, yeah. the first tax you people undertook was to overthrow Thomas Ankara. This is why I'm asking you, what mm. do you know about the overthrow of Thomas Ankara? What had NPFL fighters participated? And if so, who are those or who were the leading commanders that led the overthrow of Thomas Ankara? No, the information that I got to you it needs some clarification. I will tell you the truth that um, while on our way to Libya, Thomas Sankara was president. And while we were in training and on our way back, the government have changed already to bless Kampari. While we were going, Thomas Sankara was still president of Burkina Faso. So it might happen while we were in training, while the other group were on their way there, which I cannot say. But when we came back and stopping Waga to to enter Liberia, Bless Campari was already president of Waga. It was not after we are trained and come back. The incident they are referring to it happened on our way. It, it could be where we went in stages. Those that were in the group, maybe even for the seven men group, who they were explaining for themselves. Maybe they got hooked up somewhere and they did what they wanted to do <coughs> there. But this thing happened when we were in Ouagadougou. Because I remember when we were in training, Bless and Barry have taken over Burkina Faso. He went to Libya to see Gaddafi. He was already president. And we were still in training. He said... You were designated by Mr. Taylor as Inspector General. How long did you occupy that position? I was Inspector General of NPR from 1990 or 91 up to up to 19. Up to the time Taylor became president. Up to? Up to the time Mr. Taylor became president of Liberia. You were inspector? I was inspector general. What can you tell us about the planning execution of the autobots as inspector general? What happened was that when I became inspector general in Tapeta, Upon this fellow taking my pickup away, and it was announced to me that I was Inspector General. It was not long when I took over Maryland, Sinu, and Grand Jude. 
the, what, what was said to me, what was instruct, my instruction was that since uh, Taylor was very far away from those areas, the southeastern region, I should be there as Inspector General and stay in that region to control the situation. While Autopa was taking place, I was stay there in, uh, in the southeastern region as Inspector General. Yeah. Why it is true that you may be in Maryland at the time, uh, but as Inspector General, supposed to know the planning of the autopoles and at least those who led the autopoles to Morovia. Well, uh, I said again earlier today, the operation of uh, of this uh, MPFL is structured in a way that um, we have the strike force, we have the um, the uh, army division, we have the marine, we have the artillery, and the sole responsible of that is the commander in chief. No group interfere with each other. You don't take order from anybody. But if the artillery battalion is taken in the salmon or to strike an area, that order will only come from the, from the president at the time. So you, the inspector general, you won't even know what is happening. So it made it difficult for you to know the whole plan. What was it's, your role then? My role, my role had limitation. I said that again here in my explanation. We, I'm an inspector general, which I agree. But there are certain people, the executive mansion guard unit, which these units are just called, like the, um, just a minute please, I beg you, I've forgotten. Like the strike force, the artillery battalion, the, oh, why well, I pull the paper now. These the units, the unit force directly under the president. So you cannot interfere with them. I mean, I cannot incident an arrest within those units. The artillery battalion, the, uh, the marine division, the uh, strike force division, they are all EMG uh, units. We call them executive mansion you know, units. They are like SS. They, only they are controlled by the president. They, they take direct instruction from the president. I only refer them so in case something happens and I want to know or I want to introduce a rest, I might have permission from the commander in chief before I can even uh, venture around them. Yeah. So it's making it difficult for me, but other units, the battalion commander in every unit, like other foot soldiers, have all right to institute any arrest on them. I believe as an inspector general, yeah. you may not know all the foot soldiers. You may not know the names and identities of all the battalion command, I mean, uh, the platoon commanders, uh, maybe the company commanders, but the battalion commanders are so high up, so conspicuous, so renounced, that an inspector general is supposed to know the very units and the commanders, the battlefront commanders, the battalion commanders, and so I'm asking, who was the commanded or commanding officer that led Autopoles to Morovia? I will say again that uh, I cannot tell you uprightly the commander at uh, Autopoles. I was in, I was in, uh, I was in Maryland. What really I find? Now you, you are telling about who, who, who led. The, the, the other person you are talking about, in Morovia, closer to the Commander-in-Chief, there were the Army Division, the Navy Division, the Artillery Division, the Marine Division, the Strike Force Division, the, the Atitan Unit, then they got a Norman Base, then the Wagis, these are, these are all units very close to the, to the president and he knows who will lead and he will not consult the inspector general on that. Now that I do not know, I know some of them but then I have no authority 
sole authority to arrest anybody from the divisions I just called. No. Because they take direct order from the president, from the commander in chief. It is not the question of arresting or the power to arrest. The yes. question, you know, the work of the TRC is to get a clear picture. Yes. And you have taken oath to give, to testify nothing but truth. And so we are asking you what is lies within your certain knowledge. Uh, we don't say whether you have power to arrest or not to arrest, but whether you know who was the commanding officer that led the troop here uh, during the autobots. That's, that's the only question I ask. Well, they, they you, the or to which say. unit? All the units that you call the names down, all of them were part of the autobots? Well, that is why I can also tell you, because if, if, if the commander in chief is closer to these units in the Aima Rovia and I'm in Kipamas, which will make it difficult for me to answer your question because I was not involved in the autobots, I was uh, in uh, Maryland. But Lakasha like Jacob, who was, uh, who was heading the executive uh, mansion battalion, he was a very powerful man, and Benjamin Yet and the SS, who were also powerful. And, and, and these people are very powerful people who I have no, you know, authority over. But they were all commanders who, who were very close with the president. And they take their instruction directly from there. And, and let me tell you how NPFL runs. If, if you are in NPFL and the commander in chief is dealing with you and telling you to do certain things, and if you are a commander in the field, or other or, or, or strike force commander will not know what the entire division is doing on the other side. That how he operates. That how uh, Taylor's uh, operates. Any other person from MPFL will tell you. If he gave you an instruction to do certain thing, the other group would not know. Even me, if I want mission to go up somewhere, the man coming after me would not know what my mission is or what my mission was. So it would be difficult for, to, for me to tell you who were heading the auto parks and who led the auto parks. And auto parks is a group group operation, very, very large group operation. The all MPFL, you know, high command was taking part in. Even though we had radios are listening to what was happening, but I was seeing Kipamas. What about April 6th? April 6th. April 6, um, the last war in town. Yeah, I, was, I was in Monrovia, and I remember. How it came about as Inspector General? April 6, I was still the Inspector General because uh, I was in Monrovia, and I came to Monrovia one night, and I was stopping in uh, Banasio. And what happened was I had I came down with my bodyguards and they were fighting, you know, broke up. And while I was living, I really can't think how it started, but when it started, I knew I got into my car and coming to what Banavre Junction, I was intercepted by a group of boys and they are ordered me down from my car. And who are you and where are you coming from? And this huge fellow, my dingo fellow, came from the back. And say, oh no, this is General Blah from MPFL. Oh, you can let him go. Then later on, I saw a group of group of men. These people seem to be like crown people, and they were all arrested to be taken away by a certain group. And I stopped. I intervened and I told the boys, said, hey, leave these people. You are take. You are trying to arrest." And they recognized me to be an inspector general from, from MPFL days. So they left them, and I took them in a car. They were responsible people. One was a doctor, and one was uh, that the news now I cannot remember. But they were all crime. And they said they were all from, uh, from Yulimo K or so. And they, they are bad people. They were taking them away. They broke away. 
and they were taking them to their camp. And all I know, I cannot tell you exactly when it started. And, and how it started, and it, that was not my plan, it was not my making. During the, the fightings, many civilians killed, were killed. But our personalities targeted. And among these personalities, you have a great number of NIMBA citizens of national stakeholder. You talk about Jackson F. Doe, Stephen Dania, and others. What do you know about the killing of these people? Well, there's the same thing I'm saying. I know that these people were killed. The one incident I was involved, that I got a little bit, I mean, I got annoyed, was that on one location, they were not doing the auto parts. When the people were running from here, David Toe, um, David Dwayne, David Dwayne, Afri Frumo, Afri Frumo, we that was in Kakata, and somebody ran to me on my way from Banga. David Toe was my uncle. He took me to school. So somebody came running to me and said, "But are you one man asking for you? But they tie him in the police headquarter in uh, at the Kakata police headquarter." So I ran. So when I came, it was there were only three of them that was there. Stephen Daniel was there, Alfred Rumble was there, and David uh, Toa was there. So when I went inside, he was tied on his back. So I said, but who tied this man? Who tied this man? That nobody could answer. So I said, losing the man. Some police boys were around. I said, this is my father. Who tied this man? They losing him, he began to cry when he saw me. So, yeah. so his wife, his wife was outside. And uh, when she saw me, and they ran to me. It was the very first time seeing me since I came from Libya. The very, very first time to see me since I came from Libya. Because I always be her huh, and just coming in from Kipama so. so. So I told the woman, I said, look, let's go to Bright Farm, buy chicken, and cook for teacher to eat. I used to call him teacher. I said, so teacher can eat. He said he was not eating. So I said, no, you must eat. Nothing will happen to you. And he has been losing. I let them loosen all the three men. Then somebody came from outside, one of our fighters, and they said they were just returning from... Uh, Haber, what till I was stationed. They said the chief wants to see you. So I told David's wife, I said, okay, cook the food, cook cassava leaves, less cassava, the fresh chicken, take it, you will eat. I left some of my bodyguards there and I ran to, to where the, our commander was, commander in chief uh, Taylor was. So I said, Chief, uh, you sent for me. He said, but what do you have sent for you? I said, Chief, man, the boss King journal, he said, you sent for me. But in fact, I was coming here. Excuse me. <coughs> uh, my uncle is tied. I asked that you, you are, I mean, when I asked, the question was that you have ordered that he be tied for investigation. He said, he said, Moses, who told you that? David is also my brother-in-law. So I said, but the man is tired. I just uh, lose him not too long ago in Kakata. And the boys are flying around there. Then he said, in fact, in fact, uh, David then did all kinds of things here. They did all kinds of some kind of newspaper he wrote. He called me criminal. And uh, he said, oh, my, my sister got the paper. You know, I can let you read it, you know. So I said, but then he loosened now. He said, then he joke, jokingly told me, he said, look, that my brother-in-law, and nothing will happen to him, you know, and you will be okay. That the last word from Taylor to me. So I, I drove back. I said, Chief, I'm leaving. I'm going back to Kakata. He said, all right, and I saluted and I left. 
then upon reaching Kakata at the police station, I saw a girl woman with a willow market. She was sitting in the market there. She threw sand to me and said, Come. I went. He said, Oh, as soon as you left from here, they took the people away. So I got, I got a little bit, you know. It was shocking. So I ran to the police station. They were not there anymore. So I asked the police boy, I said, What are the people that I left here today? He said, But police are not soldiers. They saw that people, the king here, I know exactly who took the people, put them in car, they took them away. Then the same woman, when I was coming, she called. Said the people have been gone ever since. So. And the car that carried them, I saw the car empty coming back. You know, quietly, and she told me. So I didn't go back to Taylor. I didn't ask anybody. I felt very bad that day. Then I started coming towards Monrovia. I was trying to look for my relatives that were missing in Monrovia. Some of them were along the way in Mount Barkley. And uh, my daughter was pregnant at the time. And somebody showed her location. I uh, was looking for her. I found her. I have a crazy little brother who is uh, not good in the head. I, I found him that day too. And I took them to Bama with me. And that had to die. That had to die. Since then, I have not seen David to it. That what I knew about that day. Now, what did you deduce from what Mr. Taylor told you? First, when he said, in fact, David to is my in-law. And then later on, he said, well, they say all kind of things about me. Even he called me criminal. How do you understand? So are you saying that the arrest and perhaps the execution were done with the knowledge of Mr. Taylor? Uh, it is uh, difficult to say also. But the conclusion to me, this is why I did not go back to him, because the answer I received was not favorable to me. So when you say somebody wrote all kinds of paper and say about you, but I was not the one who was giving order to kill anyone, which I would stand by my word. But if it could be anybody, that judgment, I mean, it should be kept to myself. Because that was, that was what was said to me, and the person disappeared. So I cannot say he gave the order. But he said the last word was at his brother-in-law, and nothing will happen to him. That was what he told me lastly. But he did mention that this person, they wrote a paper, and they say he is a criminal, a what and what and what. That was said to me also. What about Jackson Abdo? Reed Billy and the others. This is another killing. That what I told you that uh, in the operation of the MPFL, if I'm the Inspector <coughs> General, I have limit, a limitation. If I'm not supposed to know certain things, and knowing that this man is with really David. Uh, uh, Jason Doe Jason Doe's sons married to my sister and as I'm speaking to you they are still together and I will tell you again another story about Jason Doe Jason Doe was in Harbell the had a garden I didn't see him but I heard that he was there but then while I was coming to Mount Bagra as I told you looking for my relatives I saw my sister when I saw my sister with this Jason Doe's son, he was not known by the fighter. They didn't know who he was. So I, I gave them leave to Kakata. But when we got, we got to someplace, Morris's farm near Kakata, that one I saw some of our fighter, and they recognized him because he was in the army. And they said, oh, that's that, that, that Jason Doe's son. Jason Doe's son. So I pulled him down. Pull him down. So I said, no. You're pulling me down for what? Now there was the second time I ran to Bikana, I mean to uh, have with this ball. I went to Brother Dilla. I said, well, this is my, my, my in-law. This is my sister's husband. And then they, they are forcing him out of the car. We were more exchange gun because when they tried to put in, I, I resisted. And I took my gun too with my bodyguards. But then when I told him, he said, well, if you show... This boy is, I didn't ask for Jackson Doe. I was only referring to this boy who was with me in the car, his son. 
So the body, the teller told me, said, well, I said, you think this boy, he's a soldier, you think he's strong, he can fight? I said, yeah, he can fight. I said, well, chief, please allow me to take him with me. If anything happens when he, when he does anything, I will be responsible. He said, okay, take him with you, like your soldier. So when I came back, I told the commander, I said, I got an order from the president that nobody harm about this man. This man will be stand with me, and he is my bodyguard. And he stayed today with me, working in my yard. After it became crystal clear yeah. that these people had been killed, yes. you as an inspector general, yeah. did you make any recommendation uh, since you were responsible for litigation yes. to investigate yeah. and ascertain as to why these people were executed without due process? Did you? <laughs> well, what happened here is this. I will come back to the function of NPFL. National Patriotic Front does not operate that way. There were special frontline commanders responsible for, for what you are talking. If I come from Kipamas on my assignment and telling Taylor here in uh, in Habar, that I'm investigating someone who brought Jason Doe, which I know that he was in Habar, in the area where Taylor lived, that I would be questioning authority. I might get hate from that. I might get hate from that. But do you know, as the Inspector General, whether yeah. there was uh, a board set up, whether military? personnel or civilians that have been accused of any crime that go before that tribunal that, that, and be given trial as the inspector general do you know yeah yeah that, that's that why it did not happen in that way when i became inspector general the period which you are talking about i was in kipama as i said i came to banga and there was a bull already in Banga set up by, by the commander-in-chief headed by another individual to investigate as a tribunal set up by someone to investigate these kind of matters. That was normal within my reach to go to the commander-in-chief and say, well, we saw this person is dead, this person is missing, and you got to investigate. Then the way NPFL, I don't think I will be sitting and talking to you as I am today. Who was the chairman of that tribunal? The chairman is Swan Madonna Bois. He was the chairman of the tribunal. Madonna Brown. Bois, Bois. Bois. Bois, yeah. Madonna Bois. Do you know whether he's still alive? Yes, he's in Morovia. Some place. It's in Monrovia. It's in Monrovia. Do you know anything about the arrest, detention, and execution of Dr. Yakasen? The, the then president of the University of Liberia? No. 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 I cannot. Do you know what I... Uh, these uh, civilians that you're talking about, Jackson Doe and others, whether they were given hearing, were they tried? No, not to my knowledge. Not to your knowledge. So they were summarily executed. Yeah, not, not to my knowledge, to be exact. Do you know anything about Sam Toki? Yeah, I heard it. I heard a rumor that Sam Toki was arrested in Kakata by the director of the SSS, Benjamin Yeten, and, and took them away. His wife, his sister, his driver, and a bodyguard. And 
I really didn't know anything further than that. And took them away. The fate of the Ghanaians in the Sierra Leonean, they were arrested. And you said you took them to Bikana. Yeah, Flamingo. What happened to them? They were, they were there with me when the Echo Mark came and some kind of peace settlement reached. And we had Echo Mark into our control areas. And they, they decided to go home and some decided to go on to Ghana by the, the Echo Mark boat that was here. And they said, you know, they, they can't disperse. And everybody decided to leave because they were safety now. Yeah, because they were Echo Mark in our midst. And no more, you know, random killing. When Vice President Doug Ollier died, Taylor said he would like uh, Doug Ollier to be succeeded by a religious person. So they were advised him on issues but he was pressurized never to forget the Banga commitment the Banga connection and you as train commandos who went to Libya came back and became Inspector General. Can you tell us, if you know, what was this Banga commitment or Banga connection? My connection was not Banga connection. This statement I said that the second in command must come from Libya was said in Tajira camp in Tripoli, Libya. It was not in Banga. When, when, when Tiller visited the camp, and uh, Copa Miller and, and uh, Augustine Wright was taken away, that when he made a statement, he said, I promised you that my second in command should we succeed, and I'm president of Liberia, the second in command of my government should be from among us here in Tripoli. The commitment was made in Libya. It was not made in Banga. So when you talk about Banga connection, uh, I think it should be something else. But to become vice president or, or what, then I became ambassador. And I'll repeat again for, 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 for clarification. Uh, I was not inspector general, then I became, uh, vi I mean, I became uh, ambassador. And when I came back to Liberia to take my family with me to Libya, I've stayed already three years as an ambassador. That when Ina died, and I went to take leave of him to leave, and that when he told me, wait, 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 until I found myself at the party headquarters of the MPP, when it was announced to me that I would have to replace Ina Dogulia, that I became vice president of Liberia. Now I became 28th vice president of Liberia. So, could it be then that there was a Libya commitment, and that commitment was confirmed in a farm in Banga that constituted the Banga connection? I would say again, Banga connection, if there was any, but the connection I'm very concerned about is the connection from Libya. Because Libya, in fact, you were questioned that uh, we are in a very large group and and we are fighting together so he said he, he brought a parable he said what happens to you boys if a hunter goes into the bush and kill an elephant and he only took the head of this elephant and gave the body to the rest of the men you wouldn't be happy because the whole body of a i mean the elephant where well, well, include the tie, the hand, the, the stomach, the everything, and only the head. 
and we all laugh and say that we will be happy if we are taking a whole elephant and the, the chief hunter is only carrying a head which is nothing because he had nothing but bones. So that, I mean, that's how the connection started. It was in Libya. But I had little to say about the Banga connection because I do not know much about it. So could we then conclude that because of that Libya commitment, yeah. that is, when I become a president or head of state, NIMBA will produce the second person. Could one then conclude that because of that promise, uh, the citizens of NIMBA that were an integral part of the war, in which you were the most seasoned officer, did not care the number of persons that died for NIMBA? Wow. This, this, this question is, uh, how would that be uh, such a donkey? your uncle. Why, why should I be such a donkey a person? If you know along the way, the difficulties I went through. I went through questioning. I went through security check. I went through a lot of things. Like, the eyes are on me. And even before becoming this president, which you just mentioned, uh, Commissioner, before becoming president of Liberia, it was it was it was really a big tussle. The tussle all derives from what you are talking about. Knowing fully well, the people of my countries have died, including my uncle, my father to say, and to make such a man a president of a nation. If 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 if, if you know Commissioner the thing I went through, the checking, the security on me. That's something that I don't worth mentioning, I cannot, because I went through some difficulties. You are a librarian. You saw what happened to me here. I went to jail for nothing. Nyondra Mokroman, who was a speaker, must become president in place of the president of Liberia. While I'm healthy, I'm okay, uh, I'm capable of doing my job, I've already become vice president for three years, and, and, and somebody else to come. I mean, if you look way down the line, Commissioner, you would think that the mental, the torture I had on me, but the kind of organization I was seeing, I have a family, I have relatives here, I have my home here, I have a farm here. If what happened to them, I didn't have money. What happened is if I just leave because you had just killed my uncle and I have to leave, I would be killing all of them. I fell a pin. I fell a pin. I fell a pin. Why would my uncle, the person who took me to school, educated me, die? And then I'd be happy because I'm from one MPFL. Is it true that you led the NPFL forces to the eastern, western region? Southeastern region. Southeastern region, including Grand Gide, Grand Cru, Sano, Maryland County, River G. Uh, is that true? No. Those areas have their own commanders. I didn't lead any troop. I have one small pickup with my bodyguards. I went as an inspector because the area was very far from the commander-in-chief. In fact, going to that area, there was a cost. As I told you earlier in my explanation to you, I went to Maryland because there were violence, a lot of lootings were going on, and, and the companies uh, there were closed down because of harassment. And the people of Maryland have called through media, they called BBC, and said if Taylor is still having the men in Maryland County. We will leave and they play with remain on empty ground and turn over to Cote d'Ivoire to stay there. So upon receiving such a radio communication, that went tell us, please go to Maryland and make sure the place is clear. I know you, you are a soldier diplomat. You can, uh, you can control the situation. That I went there, I didn't leave troops there. I never been to Grand Crew, so I was 
I, I patrol in uh, Sino and Granjida. I never let a foot soldier like a field commander know. I went directly there and was making sure that situation that put under control. One of your generals, as well as so many civilians, testified and even you responded to one of the general testimony that you were the battlefront commander no. when Grand Jeters were captured no. and took over by NPFL. No. What, what can you say about this? Are you prepared to face that person if you say no? I can face that person if I tell you, if I tell you as, as, as Moses Black. I read newspaper, I heard news that say I left soldier, I killed innocent people. Never, never. I was never a foot soldier. I never took gun to fight. I was only doing my uh, inspection. I was going from place to place, more especially in the southeastern region. And the people in the southeastern region can bear me, even in a identical Grand Jida. From Grand Jida, you are talking about. I was brought to Banga for questioning because I opened corridor for the people of Grand Jida, the elderly women, the babies, the, the, the pregnant women, to go to La Côte d'Ivoire because our fighter was there raping and looting and doing all kinds of things. So I opened the corridor and told the people that once you are old and you, we are not here, we are only here for AFF soldier, you soldier, please stop fighting, hurting these people. And they went to La Côte d'Ivoire, I mean, that, uh, the, uh, uh, Africa Coast. And that's why I can remember. I had no general as such to say my general. I had no special general. Now, that's why I brought with me in this gathering today, in, in before the TRC. The people who are what with me as general at the time, they are still here. They are still with me today. No what? other general like that person named as so. I brought a newspaper, I got it with me. I had a newspaper when this is the paper and I heard all kinds of rubbish in it. And I went to face this person. He never a general, nowhere. The name I saw here, is that the person you are referring to? This is the son of a criminal. This man called Tata Boone has a boy with a gun dragging behind him. He was beating the hour, broken for looting. And that the son who wrote this, who, who, who made the announcement. So I brought this newspaper and been waiting to face you with it. This man, the father of this man is called Dr. Boom. He's also from Kipamas. And this boy was behind the father doing some, some looting, doing all kinds of things. And this man was arrested and beaten. And I think he died with a broken arm. And this is the boy who wrote all kinds of rubbish. I was never a leader of a battalion, I was never a leader of a war. I told you I came to Tapeta and the battalion commander asked me to go to become a third platoon commander, which the company commander refused. He said, this is a man who was our chief in Libya, he cannot be a platoon chief before me. And I went to La Quinta town and the man wanted to seize my pickup. And from there, I became inspector general until I became president of this country. So I was never a full soldier. I never led war to anywhere. I was only an inspector. I call a shot today again. I will come, let me come let, from clarification. Let me just say something for you to know. What happened again in Grandjida? I went into the bush. I was bringing the people with her food with our shoes in the uh, administrative building. There were a house then, and were looking for planting, banana, cassava, go to Tabata, pick a load and bring it to them. One time I went on the highway to Sino, on my return, one San Lato, one of our dirty commanders, had been there and fired these people. There were about 30, 40 dead bodies. I got, no, I got crazy. 
I think about what happened, what the old ladies, the, 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 the mother of young children, and uh, the who could come in and do this kind of atrocity. That night, I, I, I ran to Banga, I drove straight to the commander in chief to report what San Lato had done. He was never had son around there. Why he has gone there to kill these people? He had gone there earlier and told President Taylor that I opened corridor for enemies to leave and come to Ivory Coast, the people we are fighting and letting them out. So I told the president that's not the case. It's a lie. This is a lie. He said, oh, we'll send for San Lato. He was arrested, investigated. I wasn't there. Later, I saw him again somewhere, Mount Parkley there. He had fired another person with a TV set. He said this person was, uh, was looting a television. And that's how he made a fate. The last time they took him to Banga, that one tell us, that you, San Lato, you are killed. You killed him, Grand Judah. And you will not go free with this one. Does the TV belong to you and you kill this man? Fire the little boy. And that why he was ordered executed too. I think he was investigated. That, I think that, that, that included that thing he did in Grand Judah. But I was never a full soldier. I was never a commander of any army to go. I became adjutant general from Libya. I became inspector general. I became Liberian ambassador to Libya and Tunisia. Vice president of Liberia and president of Liberia. I was never a full soldier, I was never a battalion commander, anywhere, to lead any troop anywhere. Thank you, sir. In, 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 in Kipamans, yeah. you were accused of looting. You have admitted of forcibly opening a container and got two jeeps there from. An addition property that was also taken by the same way was the Harper City generator. Good. What did you do with well, that? Well, let me Is it true that you took the generator and if so, what you did with it? Just, just, just a minute. Let me come to you one by one. I was in Harper. That was a security check when it comes to the two jeeps. There's a container, I got a security tip off that they were gone in a container and whatnot and what it was. So I asked my man to bust into the container open. And when they opened, there were two jeeps and that were reported to the commander in chief. And I got, I got, I got the, 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 the okay to go ahead to have them used by our operation. I didn't, I, I never looted. Everything I did, I consult the commander in chief. This is why I was inspector general. Now let's come to the generator. There was a big, huge generator in the power powerhouse in Harper. And uh, I don't know who to President Taylor or Commander in Chief Taylor that there was a generator there. And they wanted a generator in Banga. They wanted to use the generator in Banga. So he said, Well, send the power cut off and they are using the generator. I'm sending people to Banga, I mean, to Harper. And we will take the generator when, when everything sees, I will replace that generator or give the new generator. That when the people came, the people came from Banga and took this generator away. And I made sure that it was delivered to him in Banga. I did not loot any generator. As president, yeah. how long did you remain in office? How, how long you spent in office? <laughs> Well, I don't think it does matter, but I will let you know. I was in office, uh, let me just tell you when. Let me look at records so I can lie. I was uh, president of Liberia August 11, 2003, and I retired October 11, 2003. August, September, October. Yeah, yeah. I ask this question to ask you. Yes. That in Liberia, yeah. line issue has become one of the greatest conflict lighting issue. Yeah. Despite the contentions by many people, yeah. there are certain rules and procedures 
Yeah. Lay down in our statute and a constitution yeah. concerning selling public land. You only spent three years in office, I mean three months in office. Yeah. A land was surveyed in September to have. Yeah. Claiming to be a public line, sent to your office September 25th, and you are reported to sign that paper, even though the time set up for the president to sign, the kind of uh, announcement supposed to be made was never made. Is it true that you sign uh, these? Uh, during your three months stay in office? My God, when you say these, then that will be the large quantity of these to be signed. Well, I have records of what I signed as president of this country of Liberia. I consulted people from Lions and Mines. What are these? Uh, these should be signed by me. You know, when you are a president, I don't think I have to unilaterally sit down and start signing papers. I had a vassal that was telling me, oh, this is right, you can do this. Or as maybe I'm misled by someone, but uh, I, I cannot remember until I see these documents and say when. Because what we are talking about has been quite a long time. I pass you a copy of a D. Yes. Say, Harry officer, please look at it. You will see it that a D was prepared the land surveyor, the surveyor of the county surveyed the area on the 12th of September 2003. Yeah. And was presented to you on the 25th of September 2003. And was signed. And I was still president. Yeah, you signed as a president of Liberia. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the signature. What are the first day your signature? I think you will give me a time. Let me look at my documents and look at this uh, and make sure that I ever signed a deal like this. So, you will please allow me, it takes time. I have a lot of documents, you know, in my, uh, in my cabinet that I make sure that I sign these. But you said these, so I got to check how many of these are signed and how was they brought to me. So, uh, please, uh, I will have to take this paper and, uh, and I will respond to it later and send the document but to you. did you look at the signature? I saw the thing. I mean, it, what am I signature? Is here your signature? I would not say now, because the, the signing here looks, uh, my signature looks funny, so I, <laughs> it looks funny, so I, <laughs> I will have to, you, to be a lawyer, you will have to give me time. You, you, you have to give me time to, to come and check. <laughs> Commissioner, please allow me to. Audience, please. Let's have a quiet. Commissioner, please allow me. Your to, laughter uh, interrupts. To check this uh, paper up, I will get to you with. with okay, uh, Madam, please. With an please. accurate report on this uh, document or any other deeds, we are going to check. Okay. So the understanding now is you are going to check. I will check. And, and when you check, yes, you will let us know. Yes. Please do so by writing because you may not come back again to take us time. Yeah, I will write. All right. So if we don't receive any reply from you, <laughs> yeah, then it's construed that yes, yeah, I sign. That's your signature. Yeah, but then I have to write you. Okay. I write you and also send a photocopy because every day I sign, I must have a photocopy to keep. Okay. For a day like this today that somebody will come and say that I'm your land and somebody's land was sold and, and why not. Thank so you. that's the kind of procedure I follow. So I, we have to check this deed. Thank the you. signature there is not clear. It look, it look funny. Thank you. <laughs> I 
Okay, so as an inspector general, my last question. Was it ever brought to your attention since you one of I mean your prime responsibility was to investigate the attitude of the Soviets? Was it ever brought to your attention that civilians were killed for no other reasons but either for their tribes, religions, or employment? Was that ever brought to your attention? That was, that was very numerous uh, reports. I, I got reports on soldiers raping, looting, and killing and illegally, and they were dealt with. Some were being transferred to Banga for investigation. And, and that, was, that was simple. And uh, let me just bring you back to one of uh, one of uh, the legal uh, things that happened when I became Inspector General, as I said here, a, a man, one of the soldiers from MPFL, one of our fighters, came to Kakata, Nakakata, uh, Ganta. There were about three in the night and went into a Lebanese store and they slept in a cartoon. I don't know how they got there. And while the man was asleep, they went and took what they could take, you know, got sufficient money from the man, and they, they choked the man to death. And, and two of the men jumped out of the, uh, the store through the windows. And they told their friend, who was drunk and sleeping in a cartoon, that we are going to open the door for you by money, and uh, you be here, because it's almost day. But unfortunately for him, sleep carried him, and he slept there. And when the man could not open his door in the morning, that when the Lebanese around there when they bust the door, and they found his body by the, by the window, and by the door of the house, and they dragged the, the body, and the, this matter was reported in Banga, and I was called on radio, I think I was, I was in, uh, on my way, to Tapeta, to my village. And tell us that we got to rush to Ganta. There's a murder taking, I mean, taking place last night. And when I went to uh, Ganta, this man was in jail, this fellow. And he explained to me exactly that they had gone there to steal and they killed the Lebanese man. And these Lebanese people pretend they were crossing all the stores and they were leaving Ganta. That was the NPFL control area. So I went back to, uh, to Banga and to uh, President Taylor what has happened. I said, the man met at killing this man, he said there were three, but the other two escaped. So he said, but look, this is no tribunal case. Sell a boat, sell a man and, and with some police officer. Let the man write that he killed this man. And he refused to be executed, let him die. I came to two days. And he sent after me to see whether the man was still living. And I said, yeah, the man is guilty, but he let me say, look, what you want me to, then let me give you death warrant, I mean, that's what you are waiting for. And he took a green ink on a piece of paper, if the man is guilty, he must be executed. And we came to Ganta, and it was raining, and we called all the Lebanese people, and I ordered, I said, this boy have killed this man. And these Lebanese people about to leave and close their stores. Then he must die. That's why he's, uh, he, he got his body fit and he died right there. For looting and killing somebody like that. So when you say inspection, that's what our founder are doing. Our really a strong inspector making sure that thing goes right. People in Kipamas will tell you that. People in this grand judo will tell you that. I was never a first soldier to take gun to shoot anybody. I had to save people. That's my star. I think this is why Taylor made me an inspector general. Thank so, you very much. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, oh. I'm Commissioner Pearl Brown Bull, oversight for historical review, among other service. Uh, Commissioner Shikafuma asked me I was a lawyer for you, but for that paper, I have to say, Sheik, 
you have to give him a photocopy of that deed so he can really see where his signature because his photocopy and now tent and now original so please <laughs> our americas for that i see why you're my lawyer thank you um mr witness pavwa oh couldn't talk couldn't talk figures couldn't talk couldn't talk figures good 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 it's good it's good wie lange wie lange bleiben sie in deutschland smooth okay okay um those um fun to assign president the republic liberia is correct yes commissioner yes yeah, shokran no i'm trying to say something no, shokran shokran what i'm saying i'm saying this to you because shukran, shukran, shukran. my research yeah mr chairman you see you still you so far no while uh i went this way by speaking to you my research shows that you mr witness besides being a trained mechanic you all you are fluent and i wanted to find are you fluent in english german french and arabic is that correct yeah when you say fluent yeah i speak those languages because uh, I attend a Coronado Institute of Languages in Germany. And um it was not long but I could find my way. Mm. That was maybe to become an ambassador. Yeah, so that's what I was uh asking you those questions in the various language. Kurita was telling you hello and that's why you oui, responded yes, and yes. how long in French to say you the former former president of Liberia and Arabic I was saying thank you I wanted to see yes that correct you are correct. correct thank you, you. are correct yeah. many people didn't know that now since I'm for history I will be asking question along that line you are correct. among others uh, I understand you from the Kyo tribe right Yes. or Dan tribe. Yes. Which is a ethnic group from northeastern Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh during a historical review, many people propose uh for us to change citing symbols, citing uh, uh things uh we using like the seal or the words on the seal, citing um uh, uh symbolic objects that we have in the past and as the 22nd president of Liberia and someone who served this country and from where you started as a mechanic I think you went to school in Nima right yeah in Lamco you keep on yes. yes what school Lamco VTC SVTC yes so want people to know who Moses Bla is because your name would be done. Your name already in history, the 28th vice, uh, vice president of Liberia and the 22nd vice president of Liberia hailing from Nima County. You are correct. So history cannot cheat Nima of not having a president. You are correct, Commissioner. Okay. Now, I want to ask you this question. How do you feel about the changing the symbol, I mean, changing the motto, the love of liberty brought us here? Another group said, the love of liberty you should unite us. Now, you say you're from the Gio tribe. My, my uh, research shows that the Gios was a, it's an ethnic group from northeastern Liberia and Cote d'Ivoire. That migrated from East Africa to the present day Mali and Guinea several hundred years ago. And their current location is in Liberia and the Arab coast. That you all invaded, they were invaded the coastal region, replacing some of the Atlantic tribes and pushing back the crew. So, with this information, that even the Gios, they came to Liberia sometimes you know like all other tribes trying to say find out whether this motto the love that for us to understand the love of liberty brought us here that maybe people only fear is for one group of people who came here i think 18 21 22 up to 1847 that there were people who came and probably it's important maybe for all of us to know when we came here 
So with this, how do you feel about this thing about changing the motto from the law for liberty brought us here to some other reason or why? Knowing that I've just given you from the Kyo tribe who can claim to be, who, 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 who this tribe is a Liberian tribe, registered as a Liberian tribe, Gyo or Don, they call them, that came from East Africa to Mali and Guinea several hundred years ago and down in this area. So do you do, what do you want to tell me about the motto? How do you feel about the motto as it is and a statesman? Well, you people are historians. You know what to do. But then, uh, to my own knowledge, everybody in this country must come from somewhere. We all came from somewhere. We found ourselves here in a place called Liberia today. And this, uh, you know, when the when motto law of liberty brought us here, it will sound old. I mean, when to, to any young, you know, new Liberian people, they will always want to question that. To say, but then we were here before. Like you are just telling me, mm -hmm. I, will, I, I didn't know where I came from before coming to Liberia. So if this is the case with me, I would prefer that the law of liberty met us here. Because I opened my eyes out here and I met my, my great grandfather here. And you are telling me they came from somewhere. Then if so, then we have to find solution. Because we all came from someplace, somewhere, mm -hmm. before coming to this country. So uh, I think you can help us with that, Mr. Uh, Commissioner. Yes, Commissioner. thank you. I just throw that out for many of us to remember, to start, you know, because at the end of the day, we have to come up with something and we're supposed to get recommendations. So that's why I ask you. You gave your reason for joining NPFL. Yeah. And my question is uh, to confirm or affirm or don't. You said that uh, you move into other foreign countries and train them to come back to Liberia to remove the dual government because what? Because your reason was that uh, dual, you can't fully involve in the National Patriotic Front because you came from the Kyo tribe in Liberia, Nima County. And there was a time some of y'all could not even speak your dialect because that was on a hit from the dual regime that had come about because the problem between Do and Queen Pa. Yeah. And you had some of your relatives that were killed, including Major Wilson to Toe. Toe. Who was a police who was in a police force and was beheaded on a beach by the two soldiers. Is that correct? Well, correct, correct. Is he the same person who said was driving from the executive mansion were arrested, taken to the executive mansion, stripped naked and his penis was stretched as long as he could and he bled to death? That was another cousin of mine, Zizi. He was a driver. A driver okay. at the executive mansion. What was his first name? He's uh, uh, Jim Zizi. So when you saw, when you all saw this, so at that time, that's what most of the Gios and miners from that area decided to flee over to Cote d'Ivoire. And that's the reason why you decided to John in 1985 in Cote d'Ivoire, when Afri, how you spell this, Mien? Afri, Men, M-E-H-N. M-E-H-N. So when Afri, Men, told you about Charles Taylor coming, you are accepted because you wanted to come to remove two. Now, you say you are chief of the organization for organization and uh, inspector general. But I can see from your testimony today, we can see, uh, would I be right to deduce or to, to, to say that even the war, starting this war, they, to get together, although you all have one objective to come to remove door, but even in that, when you all started, I can see there were lots of conspiracy, threat, lying on each other, loyalty.
and this in the central division for Congo men and country men because yeah you have all to African men Kutin didn't have the means but I see it was that was Copa Miller yes who told y'all that although y'all were being trained but y'all trained for Congo men you, you didn't want although Taylor had found a way but you didn't want for him to be the leader but you are loyal and you dispelled that and you did not join him was Prince Johnson also among you all who were trained in uh, Libya at that time Prince no. Y. Johnson when the decision was taken by Afri, I mean with, uh, by uh, this uh, fellow Copa Miller. by Copa Miller we were staying in a group of 22 men okay at that time uh, Prince Johnson have not come Prince Johnson came uh, in a group of 47 men 27 another group. 47 47 men yeah all right but uh, I can also see my I said Musa he said came and they changed him but I can see from your testimony every time when you all were in uh, because we have to find a rational and put this every time you all were in uh, Tripoli I mean in Libya and there was some problem you all would come send for Mr. Taylor in Wakaduku and you could always see that he would always try to palliate or soften the group by taking the trouble person out or considering carrying them and replacing that's how you became replaced I mean that's how they replaced Cooper and they made Asa Musa and from Asa Musa they made you right yeah right and this Robert Wensley Robert so, Wensley, yeah. Wensley he was the one who, who they had posted to kill you in Libya yeah under the bridge yeah so what happened to him did he uh, uh, Taylor took him to Wakatuku or uh, handle him to court marshal it no I was now the lawyer only the lawyer person there are other people more lawyer than me with Taylor we have other people too who really stood by Taylor who Taylor knew I'm asking about Robert Wenselin Robert Wenselin no what he happened died. with him he died in the war yeah but he arrived in Liberia he arrived in Liberia he okay. died in Kampli all right yes you know because that was left or wanted to find out yeah, no he died in Kampli and that he 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 took you now uh I want to refer to you became president uh in August 2003 yes all right chairman when you I mean commissioner I'll just want confirmation when mr. blood you became president you said quote let the nation begin to heal let all of us unite as one people and work to peace do you stay how do you feel now after being former president uh, do you feel the same way to you is this you're still feeling about the nation uniting work towards peace or how do you feel now yes uh, I stay maintain my position as uh, one peace return to this country let unite ourselves and and, 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 and build our country uh, at, 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 at good people okay and because for history uh, the president uh, Kofu of Ghana was then the head of AU who was turning over to uh, South Africa and they witnessed your the ceremony right yeah the swearing in of yes. the 22nd president of Liberia yeah and he did say that you will be president until October 2003 yeah. so that it was confirmed then that you were supposed to be president up until 2003 yes. October do you also confirm because uh, President Kufo said on that day quote today's ceremony marks the end of an era in Liberia it is our expectation that today the war in Liberia has ended so then could we say do you confirm that the war ended on that day because it is it, a historical statement that he said 
today the war in Liberia has ended and South Africa President Taho Mbeki also made it, it is indeed a shameful thing that as Africans we have killed ourselves for such a long time. It is indeed time that this war should come to an end. After being in the on court from 1985, you were 38 years old when you started the war. Yeah. I mean, to be part of this for objective, yeah. and the objective was to remove Do. Yes, Do was removed September 1990. Yeah, but the war continued, and from what we see, it almost ended on that day, according to these people. If you had to do it again. Or as a former leader of Liberia, someone who not just he rose to the highest part, uh, uh, status or position in this country, and if you had to say to uh, the Liberians, because World War II was fought with uh, weapons, but there are people who came here, like Alahaji Kroma and the rest of them, who became part of this war. We found out with this guerrilla war, there were lots of propaganda. Most of them lying, telling the Liberian people, you this place, doing this thing, when they were just talk. What, the, what lesson, or what can you tell us for history, for the Liberian young people, the older one, and why? Because you gave a reason why you went to war. And you saw many times you were whipped, you were lying, you almost, they almost killed you. So, what can you say to us for history? Well, for history, uh, I set an example becoming president for, for three months, uh, only black African leader to step down as a president willingly within three months. And I had the capacity to make war, I have guns, I have soldiers, I have everything that I could fight with. But then, because I wanted peace, we have killed ourselves. And we should do away with this uh, conquer native country. And if we stop, it didn't stop. And don't call each other native man because my name is not Johnson. My name is Yapaguro. And this man is Anderson. Jefferson, Williamson, and we all call ourselves Liberians, I think we'll go forward. We will go forward. Because if I'm Yakbaro, I'm a Liberian. If you are Williamson, you are a Liberian. So if, if, if we just unite ourselves and forget about these names, like they man cannot marry my daughter because you're a countryman. Uh, this other man cannot marry my daughter because he's a native man, he's a conquer man. If we stop these things, I think we have a beautiful country to live in. Yes, but I asked yes. from 85, uh -huh. okay, you all your were trained. Even during yeah. the training, you can see there were hatred, there were lies on each other, not yeah. just on Congo men, yeah. among yourself. So the we could even see that uh, the objective was to kill Doe. But yes. you can see that all the NPFS started, whether Mr. Taylor started, when uh, Prince Johnson came here, he claimed, you know, he even bypassed and came before. So we can see that there was some split and thing, unless he's not telling the truth, but you know, you all were there. And you could claim that, well, the Gio people and Mano people were so hurt from what do allegedly to kill him? Well, the Kyo people and Mano can get the claim because indeed Do was killed by, Ki I don't know if Prince Johnson is Gio or Himano, but he was killed from someone from uh, uh, Nima. So whatever they objected, it was established. But from 1990, we had war, the war continue. Most splinter groups, so that's why I want, you know, you talk about when you became president, how you turned over for three months, you know, when you had army. I'm talking about when the objective was to kill Doe. 
Do work till 1980. 1990. Why then? It took 1997 we had election. So we took seven more years. Equivalent to what was it? The Ecola War. That was not the first war that took so long. History showed that the De Gaulle War was fought for about seven years too in this country. So why then that if the mission was only to kill Doe, as you reflect now, why it took seven more years that we fought and there were wanton destruction of life, property, and things. So this day a voice I, would, I need from you. Well, what I was trying to tell you here is that um, when I was in the driver's seat, I heard a state of this country. At that moment, I considered the war finished because that, that, that's the pronouncement I made that I'm stepping down today as president of this country. I do not want war as president of this country anymore. Let us unite ourselves and build our country. What had happened in the past, and you are trying to mention to me, yes, yes. there was another driver in his own seat, in his own direction. But I'm going to refer Who was that driver that had no direction? I know another. I said he has a direction. He has his own mind. Mm -hmm. the, the way he drove the country. But I'm talking about my three months, our president for. So from that day, I became president of this country. I said, no more war. I turn in arms and ammunition willingly before Ekoma Kuhune request disarmament from me because I, I said no more war for Liberia. Let's bring peace to this country. Thank if you. Those things, those things that I mentioned, mm -hmm. if we stop these things, thinking that you got more money, I don't have, I'm a poor man, I'm poor, but I'm a Liberian. You got money, you are a Liberian. You conquer, you are a Liberian. You go, you you are a Liberian. So if we could just pull away these things, I'm not talking about the past. That was brought the war. That was brought the fighting. That was the period that God designated for that that kind okay. of thing to happen. Okay. It has passed. So we are disarmed in this country. Please let peace prevail. Let us live here as very peaceful people and unite ourselves. Okay. No more segregation because you, you, you conquer, because you give, because you rich, because you poor. Everywhere in the world there's poor people, there are rich people. You cannot do without those things. So, that's why I'm saying, short, that this, I'm, I'm talking for myself from my time as a driver in the driver's seat. And okay. I was president for three months. All right. And within the three months, uh, Commissioner, please let me land. The, the three months I was president for, I try my best to bring peace to this country. This is why I have to tend to set an example for the African people to see you can become a president and become an ordinary person. I drive my cars around. You can see me in town. I go to the supermarket. I go with my children everywhere I go. Now, so if you are a president of this country tomorrow, please do not hold on. Because people will be aggravated. You are president for long. You are tired with you. Then go. So oh. these are some of the things. Though we have to. You are a historian. You know what will bring peace to this country. Like when the people are tired, you tired, okay, okay, bye bye, I'm gone. Another president can maybe you must do better than you. So if these things are done in this country, we are at peace here forever. Yeah, uh, some have said yeah. Liberia was founded as a conflict nation. For any time you look at it, whether the, before we came, before those who came, you will have tribal wars. But those who came to establish a country, I mean a nation, a sovereign nation, to be among the committee of nations in the world, the way it was founded, a conflict. So, and we've been having conflicts, conflict. So, even that period now that you've seen, after they killed uh, Doe, and for the seven years, because what is, you know, for the seven years, there was still conflict, you know, conflict in the country. So this country has been just building and going on with conflict. So that was the period, as you saying, that was just time by God for conflict to come into this country. 
Because he said it continue what is time by God. But when you came the three months, you had tried to establish peace and maintain peace. Of course, it's known that you're a very unassuming man who drives your car and a peaceful, quiet person. But still within those seven years, although there was a driver in the seat, but the driver had a lot of passengers <laughs> in the seat driving the car. Yeah, so man. at what time some could say, please halt. I want to get down. This is the place that I'm coming to. Or this car was driving so much that it could, one could not stop. You know, that's what we're saying. Uh, I'm trying to say, uh, ask you. Okay. Commissioner, so you are driving, you are in the seat, you are in one of the seats with the driver driving. So why, why you didn't say stop, I want to get down at this point? Let me tell you, Commissioner, I will tell you what happened to me. I will, I will, I will come to your, your, your question. But let me tell you, before I stepped down as president, I got a lot of advices from... from some very high people in my government mm -hmm. to say no do not step down because if you step down you will suffer you will not have your benefit you you will be nothing people will not respect you and wish i might say okay happening and wah 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 but then i said no i have made my decision to step down as president of this country not that there are some drivers that are high-headed drivers. You know, for taxi drivers in town, you can see some driving, and you say, slow down. You say, you know how long I've been driving for? Yeah. You, you call me, I cut down from my car. Mm -hmm. Now there are some drivers with high-headed, so, so uh, there's a difficult thing to do that okay. you are measuring to me. Yes. So, <laughs> so now there are some drivers who can really understand. Yeah. Like Moses Black sitting here. Mm -hmm. People told me to hold on. I said, no, I cannot. I'm tired. Then the next person come and become president of this country. All right. Uh, okay. uh -huh. In June 2003, uh -huh. when they alleged that uh, uh, the United States had urged that rumor that they say when Taylor or other the country, the, the, the people talked to you to take over. And when Taylor returned, you were arrested and on a house arrest for 10 days. But you were subsequently reinstated as vice president was it really 10 days or it was one day or two days but before you answer that you said that the incident was a misunderstanding between you and Taylor and were clear but at that time you said and I just a question I really want you said besides not being an ambitious person that quoting I'm quoting plan and besides not being an ambitious person I will never betray President Taylor he is my revolutionary brother. We have come a long way. So, did you say that? Yes. So, uh, do you confirm up there now, you know, that uh, you still maintain that you have come a long way and that you will never betray him? No, I have no cause to betray anybody. Okay. There's a fact that I cannot betray anybody. I'm a God-fearing person. Thank you very much. I have no other question. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming to the TRC and thank you for throwing some lights on some other aspect of our conflict period. Thank you. I would like to take you back to Maryland County. The other commissioner asks about what happened in Maryland. We went to Maryland, witnesses came before the commission to testify about the, the looting of the vehicles, which we have confirmed today. But another information came out, which says a witness testified that they were in the hospital, you asked them to go and open the container. Can you comment on that? On their sick bed. This is another blinking lie. Look, uh, you 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 might not know how uh, NPFL operate. If I mean Kipamas at the time as Inspector General, and I also became Superintendent of that county. That one thing I failed to mention. I was not just Inspector General. I was in Kipamas when the people elected me as Commissioner 
they say, I mean, as superintendent of the county. So you could imagine how powerful I was to go to one segment for key to open from sick bed to open where? Nobody brought key to that bust the thing open for security reason. I told the security, please, the container has been here for long. Let us see what is in this container. And we bust open when we discovered the two jeeps. And which were reported to the commander in chief. He asked me to use them. I didn't take anybody from sick bed. There's a blinking lie. I bust the thing open myself. And did not contact anybody. So the story of, for I read that in the newspaper too. And I challenged those kind of people to face me. I got a new support here. Okay, I would like to take you back again to yeah. when the former president Taylor came to Liberia from his visit in Ghana. Yeah. You said you were invited to his house where they have full cabinet meeting. And then on, you were arrested and carried by Yetin. Your wife went there to you know, assure you that nothing will happen to you. Yeah. But during, there are a lot of rumors as to what really happened. And now that the TRC is here to find out the truth as to what really happened, could you share with us what happened to you that day? Yes, good. Well, as I said earlier again today, my wife has gone to Ghana with the president, with President Taylor. And... Uh, We're actually talking about after the arrest. Yeah, within the no, that, that, within that 10 days, what happened? Oh, okay, within the 10 days. I've been arrested already. Yes. Okay. Within the not 10 days, 11 days, let me be exact. I was, I've been detained for 11 days. And uh, I don't know what was happening outside while I was detained. I was detained and uh, one afternoon... My wife uh, keep coming and bringing me food and praying with me and say, well, God willing, you will survive. Nothing will happen. I know how honest you are. You don't have the mind to kill anybody, uh, which is true. And I know within myself that is true. What brought me to jail, I have to come back a little bit again to refresh you too. What happened was the, the whole information, misunderstanding I said, is true. What I call it misunderstanding was... Uh, the American did not call for me to overthrow. They wanted to know whether their, their safety is guaranteed while I was out of here. And I told them, yes, you are safe, I'm out here, security is all right. And that's the information he got. I don't know from where. And it was Benjamin Yeten who invited me to Tiller. The, the call did not come directly from Charles Tiller. The telephone call came from Benjamin Yeten that President Taylor wants to see you. After we met already at the airport, we shook hands, we walked, and he said, we are not meeting until tomorrow. So when I came home, I with my wife luggages in my car, and when that call came, so I got, I got confused, because the man told me already that he's going to see me the next day. So when I went to where I was arrested, I saw a full cabinet. So you, 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 you want to overthrow my government? I said, no. And I explained what I said to you just now, that there was a telephone call from the charges affair at the American Embassy for their own safety and security. What happens? The notorious ATU are roaming around, and for tonight, if, if the president does not come, what happened to us? That's from the American Embassy. And I said... I'm out here as vice president. I will not be in my compound. And the SS director, <coughs> who is in charge of security, Benjamin Yetan, is also out there. They say, you lied to me. I'll take the man from here. That I went to jail for the 11 days. <coughs> and I was there. My wife was praying with me. I was praying for myself. Until one afternoon, I saw my wife coming with a a white gown and they said that you are needed at the executive mansion. The people of Nimba are there. Some commissioners here were there too. And they went there and then uh, some commissioners from Nimba were there. So till I explain 
that we were in Ghana, you got information that I wanted to overthrow. They just wanted me to say, like you are doing to me now. They say, but what happened? You let the president and the vice president speak. So I said, no, I never, never planned coup. I said, while the president are away, the charge the affair of the American embassy, go. They were concerned about their security. And I guaranteed them that I am here and Benjamin Yetan here will be out. Don't be afraid of these ATU boys. They will not come close to your embassy. That I will discuss. And that's exactly what I said in the meeting. There at the executive mansion. And uh, President Taylor whip, you know, he cry, myself cry. Everybody cried because I was in jail. I cried why I did today. Because I was jailed for nothing. I was disgraced for nothing. Before a course. And he said, oh, you will be reinstated. The people from Nimba say, look. And there was a parable from one uh, a man from Nimba. Say we're in a period of the 11 days I was in jail for. So uh, Emmanuel Blase, the former chief justice of Liberia, everybody thought the commission they all talk. They didn't want me to. To be harmed or to be hurt. They told President Taylor, no, you cannot do this to our son. Uh, this matter, we should look into it properly. Because I have not been to court. Nobody has investigated me as vice president of this country. Nobody can just grab you and say you may coup and you will be executed for that. So, in this light, I told the president that. Uh, I am not in a coup to overthrow you. Then Blazer said, Blazer said, I gave you a parable, President Taylor. There was a man with a goat, and the man loves a goat so much, and he had a pot, the clay pot, the people didn't cook inside in the village. He said that the, the goat was, was looking for food, and he put his head in the pot, and his head got stuck. So when a man came, he loved a pot and he loved the goat. He said, but what should be done with this goat? Now if I hit the goat, my pot will bust. So he said, till I will just stop that far. Yeah, you are goat, yeah, you are pot. So you can take all what you decide to do with them. So he stood up for a long time. He said, well, now, nah, I can't understand. So they were met to say, I cannot understand too. Yeah, you are Moses Blah, being your inspector general, being your, your ambassador, being your vice president. Yeah, you go there. Yeah, you part that you love your job as president too. So, yeah, you go there, you part, what will you do? Da, I got free that day. He said, oh, no way. You will be reinstated and you go back as uh, vice president of Liberia. That the case ended. There were information in the public concerning that detention period. And knowing that the TRC actually wants to find out what really happened. Besides the illegal detention, were there any torture? Well, the torture was not physical. I had mental torture. All night I didn't sleep in peace. You know when you've been detained for such a thing and you, you, the people of uh, foreign, you know, fighting force by your window and making all kind of pronouncement. We are taking Vice President to Ravi Highway tonight. Oh, the Vice President going far. He might not come back again. This is a union boy, you know, dancing around your window. Where they had me now. So that was more than torture, you know, doing something to you physically. But mentally I was torture. I was like a crazy person. I didn't know myself. Even for the first night, I thought I was not going to make it. But when my wife came and prayed with me and gave me some encouragement, she said, don't be afraid of death. You are a Christian. And I took her word for real. And I prayed with, with her and she left. I will touch her. Mentally, I will touch her. During the same time, uh -huh. Isaac V and John Yumi was arrested. Yes. Could you tell us? This is another story. Difficult to tell. I was arrested on another occasion. I was arrested first and taken to, uh, to jail. I didn't know whether people had been arrested after me 
who they were and what happened. Except for my five bodyguards that went with me. They were all arrested. And by midnight, I heard one of my bodyguards crying in a pickup. So I said, my God, that was another torture again. No, they were taking them away. And he was crying, calling my name. So they took them. They went. I couldn't sleep. So I wonder why they took these boys to. So they went. But in the morning, what happened? Very early that morning, one of the bodyguards, before my wife could come, one of the bodyguards from the executive mansion, from Taylor, he's from my mother's home. He's my first cousin. He quietly came in, you know, he had rapport with the soldier people on guard. He said, hey God, I pray if you will live. I said, what happened? He said, last night, they brought John Yomi down and they carried them in the mansion, the way they brought them by us, the condition that the first time I knew they were being arrested. So I said, what, what are they carrying them? He said they brought them as if they were staying in a pickup. Because as if they were not concerned with this thing. He said as they had gone to escort John Yomi. Because they were together when the president called for John Yomi. But the way they brought Aze in with blood all in his eye. I mean they brought John Yomi. So they say he has seen the devil. They will not let him go. He came to me quite said the thing I'm talking. Don't tell anybody because they will kill me. So I said no. Then I became never. My first time to know that they are taking some people away and to kill them. So when my wife came, I began to cry. She said, why are you crying? But I told her, I said, I didn't want to tell you. She said, last night, as a very wife, and John Yomi wife came to me to ask if you could intervene. But I told them also that you were in jail. You have been arrested too. She said, I didn't want to tell you, but I tell you, you feel bad. I was keeping it from you. But since they took them last time, nobody knows where they took them from. That's why I came this morning to check whether you are still here. So that the time my wife became desperate and went to Benjamin Yeten. It was raining. You said, Benjamin, please get me to President Taylor. Because I'm not satisfied where my husband is. If he had committed a crime against the state, take him to court. So Benjamin brought a seat and told my wife to sit down. She sat in the ring. She said, I was sitting in the ring. And I sat in no chair. What I came here for is to release my husband. I didn't come to sit down in any chair. So Benjamin, Benjamin wanted to run. So he grabbed Benjamin by his clothes. So to walk and climb Taylor Hill was very uh, steep hill. So she was there fighting with Benjamin. So Benjamin said, let go. When they went, Benjamin let her outside, went in. And say Moses, black wife, you're humbugging me. So Taylor said, let, let, him, let her come. That the first time my wife to face Taylor. So my wife, at the same state now, I just told you, say, well, if my wife, uh, President Taylor, my, if my husband has committed a crime, please let him go to court. You cannot keep him indefinitely. And he's sitting down there. This man is a sick man. He has a cardio problem. And his medicine is not there. That one Taylor said, no. Uh, what I would do, uh, I want to send him to Habe to go to the hospital. Then my wife said, no, he cannot go to Habe. He has his medicine with him. He wants a special drug. He cannot go to Habe. So, that's the situation. That I know that people after me were also arrested and killed. Now you're, you're, you're finished? But you know what I'm coming. But then, another issue that came up was that uh, when Yomi wife and this uh, their wife went to my wife to go, my wife asked that we all should go to Benjamin Yete. That night they did not go. Maybe they were afraid. But she said, she's not drawing back until I get out of jail. Because they had me there for nothing. And when I got free, the one thing I want to make it clear, so you will know. I, I, this uh, commissioner was there. Then Taylor himself said, we arrested these people for various reasons. 
Then Taylor told me earlier when I was facing my investigation with him that I was arrested for talking to the Americans on phone. He said, Yummy, he didn't mention V. Because he himself didn't know that V had been arrested. He only Yummy he mentioned. He said, Yummy, Pai was involved in all kinds of things and people were bringing guns from Cote d'Ivoire involved at the border. There were separate things we were arrested for. They were not arrested for me or being my follower, nothing. And these people have not been to American Embassy with me. Myself, I have not been to the American Embassy. It was telephone conversation I had with the Ch Chinese affair of the American Embassy. And I said, it opened the white that I was living and standing there. That did not play cool. So you said Yumi was arrested for bringing arm and yes, fear? Yeah, to Liberia. So what was Azev crime? Azev, no. He did not mention Azev. And they brought Wookie and told me the story and the security brought to you about. When he came to my cell, he said Azev was in a car, in his car waiting for his friend, Yomi, inside while he was facing the investigation with Taylor. So I didn't know what, what Azev was charged for. I wouldn't know. Because I was in trouble doing tears, thinking I would die the next day, I would die in an hour or so. You said you were the adjutant general for, MPF, for MPFL and was responsible for training. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. I was responsible for records. For record? Yeah. Okay. And you were among the 22 men that were yeah, initially yeah. trained in Libya. Yeah, right. You had an agreement with Taylor that whenever he become president, somebody from in the special force will be the vice president. Yeah, be the second in command. I will be the second in command. Yes. So it means that you have some common understanding. Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. Okay. Even when the, when the group became bigger, and we uh, were about 168 or 58 men, and he said, repeated the statement. And then when he said, if he kill an elephant, if a hunter kill an elephant and he take the hail and loom and get the body to the other hunters, that wouldn't be good for the hunters? We say yes. So it means that he will only be the head. The body of this elephant should be divided among us. Okay. Yeah. Now with that information, yeah. this is a follow-up question to what the commissioners are asking you. Were there any point in time where you or any member of the special force talk to former President Taylor that none that President Do is dead. Let's stop this war. Well, I will tell you in a sense that you do have to tell me President Taylor that. That's a dangerous thing you are talking there. You will be called coward. You will be called all kinds of names. And, and as I'm sitting down here, if you see my name along there, I used to run from war. I'm a scary man. I'm a this one. I won't mind that. I won't mind that. If you know what NPFL is, you will know all of that. Let me tell you one instance. I will, I will, I will say this one you know, for the public to, to hear what, have, what, what has happened. One Minister of Justice, Vama, that come to me as vice president on one occasion. At that time, the war was as far as from Germany. He said, look, tell her that your friend, that your chief brother is your friend. Please let go and talk to him. Let's see, those boys are in Vanjama. I can go to Vanjama, I can talk to them. Then we can reach to a common understanding and see how we can stop this thing. He killed about two or three days. I said, okay, let's go. One afternoon. We went he was in his office in our white flower. And we went up there and uh, we greeted him. We sat down, he gave seat. So uh, he said, what is what's wrong, gentlemen? Uh, so we just came to see you this afternoon. So Minister Vama said, Chief, I came to tell you something. I can talk to these boys in Vanjama. I think the war can stop. We can send some delegation so we can see what we stop. He said, You, Vama, 
that you put the team on vice president here and you're coming here to talk kind of nonsense to me? Huh? That you put the, the nonsense in my, for my... It was not one week when Vermont got dismissed from justice ministry. You listen to that? Then I will go and tell who to start what. It was not possible. It was not As possible. Adjutant General of MPFL, So were you protecting your job or? I was not protecting my job, protecting my life. So as Adjutant General of NPFL, what can you tell us about the training or recruitment of train and training that went on in the various NPFL control area, especially in regards to children, because they have special unit called the small boy unit. No, when we came to Liberia, I think we were talking about Libya now. When I was in Libya, I was adjutant general responsible for training. Then when we came to Liberia, my job changed to inspector general to control all crimes being committed against persons. And I was also transferred to Kipamas to be in charge of the southeastern region. So that was small boy now, big men, women all came into training. That was different operation now with different people. I was inspector general now. People who committing crime are running after them, you know, and and, uh, and that's, that's that. But as Inspector General, then did you see small children fighting along with NPF? Oh, that was that was that was a lot of small people fighting. Small children, small boy unit arrested me on two occasions entering Banga in the night. I was supposed to stay in my car on the day, and they stopped me. They would not stop arresting anybody with NPFL. If you were there at the time, as any big person, you would be arrested by a small boy unit. Once they got their order from the top, you would be arrested. Yeah. And such, too. Holy comment on the killing of the six Senegalese soldiers that were captured in Vaum. Oh uh, uh, no, I was in Kipamas. I knew that some Senegalese soldier died, I heard that. But uh, it was not close to my assigned area at the time. That was happening here in Lofa. And it, you could imagine how far Lofa is from uh, Maryland. The command structure of NPFL. Yeah. Can you comment on that? Yeah, we have various units in MPFL. And, and the way they were arranged is in a way that uh, if, if, you are, if you are from the artillery unit, the Marine Division will not take an order from you. If you are from, uh, uh, if you are from Jungle Fire, you're not taking order from the marine unit. It means that it means that everybody report to the commander in chief. So nobody taking order from anybody. So that I mean he did that for security reason. I might not say I'm not talking for him. So you can have a group of men with arm and say you can give order to do anything to anybody. So everybody takes order directly from the commander in chief. As Inspector General. Yeah. So, which battalion you have control over? Which area? Did you visit the areas MPFL control at the time to no. see what was going on since you are responsible for crimes? No. I, 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 I have not controlled any battalion. What, what my job was, the specification is that I have a patrol and I see a group of arms men traveling from point to point trying to loot or go anywhere. What I do, I stop your car, you show me the pass, where are you going, I'm going to Harper or I'm going to Zwedru. What's your mission in Zwedru? If the pass is not satisfactory to me, I will have to back your vehicle, go to Banga. You cannot come here because you're not authorized to come here. So I never have battalion, no. I never control any foot soldier to fight. But you visited areas. Of course, of course. 
I feel that area I go to sign oh, when there's confusion, people will loot and report will come to me and I will go and uh, arrest anybody and send you to Banga if it is serious and I send you to Banga. But now I'm in control of any group of soldiers fighting for the battalion, even a company size, no. Coming back to the children that were fighting along with NPFL, what do you think, in terms of age, the youngest child that was recruited? The children were very small. We were not looking at the age group because we, I saw children at some checkpoints, very, very small from 12 years uh, to 16, from 10 years old. You can see the gun, the AK-47 rifle dragging on the ground. Like this man who just brought a complaint in which a photo I have in the newspaper. One Deble, when he was with his father, mm -hmm. he was nobody to fight. He was just a little boy dragging the AK-47 behind his father. Until the father was arrested one time for looting somebody, and he was flocked on mercifully I think he broke his arm. You see, so, I mean, that's the kind of man who calling himself general, and say that you general, you saw wah, 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 wah in this paper here. But I think it's good that I face this kind of man, and tell him why, why, who he is, or he, who he was at the time. So, these small people, they were just, Everybody had a small boy unit. It was not, they were not trained by one special group. People go into a place, they be captured anywhere, you see small children, and some people take them, oh, I'm a small boy unit, I'm a small boy unit. They organize their own group and had these small but unreasonable people. I think people choose to use them at the time because they are very unreasonable. What do you know about the death of Sam Bakari? What Sam Bakari death? That what took me to the Hague. Uh, Sam Bakari, one evening passed by my village with a group of soldiers, headed by Benjamin Yetin, and, and I stopped them. And I, I didn't stop them, in fact. My security people stopped the vehicles, a big convoy of vehicles. We are armed with heavy weapons. Entering my town, I'm from Tua Town, and the town Benjamin Yetan is from is at the back to the Cote d'Ivoire border. So we were almost falling asleep, and the car was stopped. And my security workers said, Well, there's a very big convoy of car coming towards the town. Then uh, one of my bodyguards saw Benjamin. Benjamin didn't want to show up. Maybe they wanted to pass. But when you saw my men, I discovered him that Benjamin was in a car. He said, oh, what, what a chief here. The chief is over to his house. So my boys came and knocked on my door. And uh, Benjamin was almost standing behind him. I said, oh, director, why are you going? He said, we are going on patrol. And we are going to uh, Butuo. And we are passing through Butuo. And, uh, and uh, we will go back to Ganta. So I said, no, we had some food here. My, uh, my sister there cook. And we had enough food. You eat something before you pass. Then he didn't hesitate. I gave them food, a bottle of whiskey. Or him and cover. In my village, I gave them a whiskey. And they sat down and ate. And I saw Sam Bogari. I saw Sam Bogari wife. Benjamin wife. And a lady. That, that I cannot remember seeing the, the a black dog, a young girl. I gave them seed and uh, gave them food they ate. And after eating, they told me they were gone. They, they are leaving. They were going. So I said, I wish you safe journey. He said, okay. And the patrol grew. He said, as he said, they were going for patrol. But later, in the night, almost day, that when one of his bodyguards came Four or five years ago, I passed. 
Then the body car can stop. They stop him and people stop the car. Because at checkpoints. When Benjamin had just brought a group of soldiers, everybody was a little bit scared. So, the boy called one of my boy, which he's here now, he's here. So he told the boy, say, look, we went on operation, but the operation Lola is not correct. So he came, he said, what kind of operation? He's very close friend to one of my bodyguards. So he came, he, he said, okay, okay. He said, go tell your chief. So he came, he woke me up, he knocked at the door, I got her. He said, Benjamin then went somewhere, I can't think they not do. Hey, you will see Benjamin here, and he come back, maybe something will happen. So I said, your pack and go, let go. Let's leave, let's leave. So we took off that morning, we drove. You might not know the area I'm talking about, so it will be difficult. We took the by road from our town. We passed through bar. We came to Saclapier. Then we drove straight to a place called Fompla, Flompa. And we went to the school building. And we hid ourselves in the bush. Very far distance, I drove myself that night. We were there. The car was passing, passing, passing. Foo, 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 foo. So the last vehicle, was well, intercepted with one of my bodyguards. He's not in the country now, Yamanya. He wanted to have confusion with them. So somebody went and said, no, no, Benjamin, don't make confusion with anybody. I mean, uh, Yamanya. So Yamanya didn't talk much. They left. So when we saw daylight, I came out of the place where I was sitting and said, Yamanya, let go. Let go straight my road. We drove coming to Ganta and we turned left to a place called Somme Camp. Then we saw another heavy robot, black security man on post. We stopped my vehicles. So I opened the car. I said, what, what happened? What going on here? He said, no, chief is sitting right here. He said, when you come, you must stop. He won't talk to you. So I banged in with my man. And when he was sitting there, he leaned back with first shake. He was blowing himself. So I said, oh, uh, Darada, how you doing? He said, man, we went on a small mission, man. The mission was successful. So I said, what kind of mission? He said, look in that pickup. When I went closer to the, <laughs> to the pickup, I saw Sam Bogaru with a military jacket that was on him, lying flat on his back, Dead and uh, a beheaded man, only a neck. I mean, his head was there and he butt on the other side. Hmm? I stood alone. I said, okay. Then I came back to him and said, Ben, I think I gotta go. I was talking to him when the pickup pulled off with the body. He left and pulled off. Then I said, Ben, I gotta go. I did not stop there. When I came to Morovia, I went straight to his to, to, to White Flower. I went to ask the person, I said, Chief, how did you do so? He said, hello. I said, did you give quietly him? I said, we're only two. I said, did you give order to Ben to do? He said, what? I said, to kill a sandburger. He said, no, no, hold it right there. He said, you are not a soldier. You are a... You are a, a vice president. It is a defense minister who is concerned with such a thing. Please. I, 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 I cannot entertain that kind of query. You want to investigate me? I said, thank you, sir. <laughs> I saluted. I got us And I went my way. Later in the evening, then the defense minister came on the air. And he said, Sam Bogari was entering the country and uh, he was intercepted by fighting people and uh, he got killed in the struggle. He was forcing away in the Liberia by way of Africa coast and the border guard people shot him. And that, that all I knew right there. That today that you're asking me. Or uh, in the Hague too. That what happened. Thank you very much for that information. Yeah. And as Inspector General for yeah. MPFL, and knowing who remained with MPFL up to 2000, became Vice President and President of Liberia. Yeah. 
looking at the conflicts in terms of and then who are responsible for crime, you know, money, ensuring that the crime was not committed. Mm. Knowing MPFL and listening to witnesses in all the various counties, it's clear that human rights violation was committed in all the counties. Yes. Do you share responsibility? Well, if, if I'm involved, if I'm involved in such a matter as you're putting it, I, 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 we were we were arresting, we were we were arresting, sending people to Ganta, we were writing report, I mean Banga, and writing reports on most of these things. If I show you some records, if it's needed here, I'll bring you a whole cartoon of records. So we were fighting crime at the time. But for personal, that's why I said, cool, my role was very difficult. I, I was not a full soldier. So I didn't have gun to at least directly shoot anybody. So I was arresting people, and when you put up resistance, maybe we fight and tie people, in, or you know, going from town to town, village to village. That's what we did. But being a member of the National Patriotic Front of Liberia, I would say I have shared the responsibility because I'm part of the group, one of the original founders of NPFL. So why MPF did directly or indirectly, uh, I cannot exempt myself from it because I'm part of the group. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Witness, good afternoon. My name is Commissioner Massa A. Washington. I thank you again for coming to the Commission. My first question is a follow-up question to uh, one of my colleagues, Commissioner Silas' question. You spoke of Mr. Bokhari um, and how he met his end. What happened to his wife and children? It is alleged that his, when he crossed over into Liberia at that time, he brought his wife and children with him, um, allegedly seeking refuge. What happened to them? Well, that, that's another thing. I won't be the one to tell you. I heard the same story, the same rumor, that his wife and children were killed likewise. And where did you hear these rumors? Within the NPFL or? Yeah, within the NPFL area. With within Ganta, within Saclaipie, within uh, Monrovia. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and at this time, uh, President Taylor was already president of this country. Okay. You knew Mr. Bokari well. How many children did he have that were in Liberia? No, I, I, I knew the man well, but I don't know his children. When I say know him well, mm -hmm. Sam Bokari came first into this country and he was in a jeep, in a Nissan patrol jeep. And uh, going down to Benjamin house, where that way he was introduced to me by Benjamin Yeten. This is uh, Mr. Sam Bogari, and Sam Bogari is the vice president of Liberia. And I got to know him, that he was Sam Bogari, the most talk above man from the RUF uh, uh, group. You spoke about Mr. Benjamin Yeten. Yeah. And um, I'm not too clear on the picture that has been created. What kind of man do you think, would you say he is? Benjamin Yeten, he's a little boy. When I was in Libya as uh, adjutant general, he even helped to wash my dirty clothes. And um, I used to have all the soldiers that want you to work for me, they work for me. But when he became bodyguard to President Taylor, and he grew so powerful, he grew so powerful that I, as I'm sitting down here, I almost saluted him because the movement the man had, nobody could just control Benjamin Yeti as easy as anybody. I don't care who you may be. Besides Taylor, 
de la Kubi, the only one to control Benjamin Yetin. Because he grew, he grew so big that at times, when he entered the mansion now with arms, Tilla one time I order that he should stay off with some of the arms and walk to him. He became so big, he was a powerful boy, very, very powerful. From your earlier description of him, you sounded like you feared him or he was generally feared. Is it true? He was generally feared. I, 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 I fear him in a sense that when he was doing some things that uh, a natural human being could not do, so yes. I, I later became very, very afraid of him. What but were some of those unnatural things? Unnatural things, they were killing your own wife. And uh, we got Roman again. The Roman said he killed his wife. He had sent his wife to Ghana with his children to go to school. And later the wife returned to request some more money. And he suspected that his wife was living, I mean loving, to one uh, Lord commander. And other that Roman the woman was murdered in the cold blood and these are some of the information for your closer bodyguards to us so i became scary you know i sing as a my god they brought a bible because i had no cause to kill my wife i would never under no circumstances i'll kill my wife if it hurts her i will not so then what do you know about the human utens alleged involvement in the Mahabrish massacre in Bomi County. The Roma again, the Roma says that uh, he had put these soldiers in a car and said that uh, they were going to pay them because these soldiers too were demanding pay. And everybody wanted a little step in and they wanted money. And, and one day they put them in a car and they took them to Mahay and said, well, look, she said I should carry you also. That's where the money is. And they went there and and everybody was dumb in the river and died. Are you talking about the handicaps, those who were amputated or handicapped as a result of the war? The handicapped as a result of the war. These are the only people who, who embarrass any NPFL uh, hierarchy. Once you are a big man in NPFL, the boys see you and they will stop you and they will demand for money. Okay, so this group, it was in combat camp, they carried them, they carried them to Mahe. Yeah, they came to the river. That somewhere to some kind of river they took them to. That's but, a Roman now because. I, okay, the question I was asking uh -huh. concerning the Mahe River Bridge involves some civilians. When we started the hearings in January, there were several civilians who testified um, to being victimized. Some of their relatives were killed, uh -huh. taken from parts of Bomi County and taken to the Mahe River Bridge, allegedly by Mr. Benjamin Yitin and some of his. Or some of his uh, um, fighters. So I was asking you specifically about that portion of this. But thank you for providing the information, the clarity on the uh, ex combatants, soldiers who were allegedly killed in yeah, that, carry that, to. Yeah, that's why I heard. That Roman I heard, yeah. Okay. Okay. You, you stated also during one of the questions from my colleague that there were child soldiers fighting along with the NPFL as young as 10 years old, some yeah. of them. And then you said the, the force used the children because they were, they were unreasonable. Yeah. Now when you say unreasonable, what, what do you mean? When I say unreasonable because they were young and they got no reasoning, and I had been arrested by them before. They searched my vehicle, I entered Banga by night, and they didn't even know who I was. I was then Inspector General, and these guys ordered me down, and said they must search the vehicle, and they did. And I knew they were acting on reasonable uh, behavior, so I gave my way, I said, well, look, check your car, see any arm, I have my one AK with me, I have no weapons in the car, my bodyguards too presented theirs. And they inspected the car and we left. Mm -hmm. And they were not giving no courtesy, whatever. This is why I said they were unreasonable. Because any reasonable person would never act to the man called Inspector General in an organization, in a military organization. And they had to search me 
in a way, you know, like some ordinary pas passenger, you know, on a car. And they did the daylight inspection and I left. So this means then that they could do anything, including they could be deadly? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. How many of such child soldiers do you think the NPFL had? It's difficult to know the numbers. Give an estimate. Because NPFL strength alone were more than 70,000 men. And I would talk about 70,000 men at different locations in this country. And everybody must have a 10 or 4 special, I mean, a small boy soldier with them. So it means a huge number. So how many units uh, did you have? How many units of, of child soldiers spread out throughout the country? They were, they were not in a unit. They were divided. Everybody's going to have a child soldier. So it's difficult to tell you the, the, the number of him. Now what I said, you know, uh, NPF uh, have control almost 90% of Liberia. So it was just difficult to know they were 30, they were 40, they were 50. Mm -hmm. 70,000 men and you must have each group, you must have each battalion have a 10, 5, 4, uh, a small soldier with them. It became a star that everybody must have a small boy unit. And the, the small soldiers were assigned with um, the, the hierarchy of the NPFL? Of course. Including the, the ministers, civilian ministers and... No, 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 not civilian others. minister. They were mostly with these military people. Okay, with the military people. Military people, people yeah. Okay. So, uh, even though you say you are not a military member as... No, I have... I have small boys out there with me. You have, okay, thank you. I was going to ask a question. I have one with me. How old was he? He was about 12, 13 years old. Where is he now? He's in school. He's with me now. How old is he now? He's about, I always think to be small boy. And one time I said he was 23 and my wife said, you crazy. This man is quite old to be about 40 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so he's with me right now as I'm speaking. And when you took him again, you said he was how many years old when, you, when he was assigned with you? He was, like, in my case with a small boy, he was, I got him from, from Kakata. His brother was shot by EFS soldier. They wanted to conscript people into the Liberian army. His brother refused, and he was shot. So when I came to Kakata, he was a lady, you know, one of Taylor's bodyguard. And they girl said, well, look, I like this little boy. And I got no fool here. Send your inspector general. You can take this boy. So when I put him in a car and went to Haber, so I introduced him to the president. I said, well, this is a boy whose brother was killed by AFL soldier. So I'm taking him to be my son. He will be with me. So I said, well, take you, boy. And he's with me today. Okay. He got a woman. He got four children. Was he when, <laughs> when, when, um, when he was given to you or when you took him, did he have to go through, did he train, did, were the small soldiers being trained, did he carry arms when he was with you, was he providing you security protection or he was just tagging? He, he got trained here, he got trained in uh, Monro here in uh, Monrovia. When Taylor became president, they have the, uh, the I've forgotten the unit, how they call them? SSU. The SSU, is that it? SSU. Is it SSU? SSU. They are SSU, I think. That way you three you went to the, the uh, short film military base and you graduated from there. And that one I took in to protect me. Was Mr. Taylor assigned or did he have small boy, uh, small boys from the small boy unit assigned with him when, when he was... Um, the head of the NPFL? Well, these boys that we tell her now, you see them, they're so huge and big. They were all small boys. I didn't see no big persons. Some but did they 15, fit the definition of child soldiers? Were yeah, they? Some were 15, 16, and some 18. And, uh, but they are all men and women, now, so uh, it's difficult to say. You cited an example of the kind of power that Mr. Taylor had when you spoke of um, the Eddington Vermont situation, the then Justice Minister, yes. and he was 
one week later fired because he tried to advise Mr. Taylor to end the war. Yeah. Uh, what, what kind of man would you say Mr. Taylor was when he was the NPFL leader? Taylor, I must admit, Taylor, Taylor as I know him to be, Taylor is so free handed he gives money out to anybody when it's necessary. Tiller, Tiller doesn't like to see anybody close to him goes dirty. He a decent person. He likes to keep clean. And um, he has some good quality in him. He is a gentleman. But please do not play with his presidency. You will die. This is true. His power. He said, do not play with my pepper bush. I was his vice president. And most of the time, if I'm driving in town and there's a syringe and my police car is blowing, and some of the bodyguards will go and say, look, Moses Bly is blowing syringe in the town and look like he wants to become president. And I will be questioned for that. So, as a result, I used to drive myself. I never cared for bodyguard. I'm afraid that the commission are protecting my job. I was protecting my life. I cut off the security. I cut off the police car. And I used to drive and go, no sound, no sorry, nothing. Because I'm afraid to be questioned. I used to live above confrontation. So, that was our coward. This Moses Bly, a quiet man, he doesn't know better. I'm not a fool. A fool will become ambassador of a country three years, vice president three years, inspector general in foreign countries, uh, up and down. So I'm not a fool, but I'd like to live above confrontation. I'm not a fool. Mr. Witness, you spoke about the, the NPFL. And as you also one of the original members of yeah. the NPFL as a, uh, special forces, yeah. How would you describe the NPFL? What NPFL were organized in Libya to come and remove the government of Samuel Kanyan Do for a purpose because the people of Nimba County was maltreated, all kinds of things happened. And, and they wanted this man to be removed and have a government that would be acceptable to all the people of this country. So later, when the organization stayed so long, and people change their mentality. We came here as special forces. We were trained just for that. And then we have politicians coming into the organization, other people coming into the organization with different ideology. Then the confusion started. That was led some of us to jail. Because I think Taylor with his own sound mind wouldn't just grab me and put me to jail. Because we have worked together for a very long time. He researched me. He respected me. But then we have been mixed up with people, you know, have own idea, with their own intentions. Some people wanted to get rich. Some people wanted to, to do other things. That, I mean, they were finding their way into the organization. That weakened the organization. So it led the organization into all kinds of things that happened in this country. So when it comes to Taylor, Taylor, Taylor is a decent person. But you've got to be strong in such a position. Okay. You spoke about your ambassadorial post in Libya. Yeah. As ambassador, what were some of the things you were doing? Because we heard that um, there were the issue of black money, that uh, you were involved, or you and people working close to you were involved in black money, they call it no. PM? No, this, it is a complete false. It could be the ambassador before me. I was the first ambassador. I told you I left Libya 
to come here to take my children when Ina Dogulias died and the president Taylor wanted me to stay to become vice president in his place. I was never involved in anything. This thing you are talking about, I heard it when I was here already, that the ambassador that was after me was involved. And they all came down as the ambassador, the vice secretary, the staff. They are right now here in Monrovia today. And they never went back. But I was there. I left there because President Taylor wanted me to become vice president in, in place of Ina de Gullier. But this thing, I heard it. And those people came and never went back. As I'm talking to you today. Okay. You were mentioning the, the, the late vice president, owner Mr. Taylor, in you know, the Yeah. What really happened to him? There are all these uh, stories around how he died. What do you know to be the truth concerning how he died? That, to my knowledge, all I knew, you know, Dugulia, the former vice president, was sick and he was taken to Abidjan and died. And uh, with one clarification, let me come into one story to you too. One time in Liberia when I was vice president, I woke up in the morning, I was bleeding from my nose. Everywhere, blood coming from my ears. And I was rushed to Ghana in the hospital. And I'm a cardio patient. And I took in more aspirin. So the doctor said the aspirin tinted your blood vessel. And it was, you were lucky it didn't go in your brain. You're going to die. But then I was in Ghana hospital when the press in Ghana came to interview me that I was beaten by Taylor and uh, they bust my head and I was dying. So I told the press, no, I was not beaten by anybody. I got sick and I took the wrong drugs. That's what brought me here. I, I'm saying that so you would know how the Roman in this country can go. But what I know about Eno, Eno has been my friend and brother. Oh, I knew Eno was sick and he died. But beating him, not to my knowledge. You spoke about the, the death of Mr. John Yomi and also Isave. Yeah. And the, the widow of Isave, yeah. Mrs. Susanna V, testified here at the TRC hearings in January. Yeah. And uh, she pleaded with the public and also the TRC passionately about information surrounding her husband's death. She's looking for closure. For example, she wants to know what really happened to her husband, how he was died, I mean, how he was killed. Where is he buried so that she may be able to, to, to you know, to close that chapter of, of her life? She mentioned you. She didn't accuse you of anything. She just said that she thought you knew more information that maybe you could share with the commission to help her solve the mystery about her husband's death. So can you just give us a little bit more detail, that is, if you know what really happened to uh, Mr. Yomi, specifically Mr. Isave, how he died, who were those involved, where did they bury them? What, what, uh if I tell you that I haven't heard, uh, Madam Commissioner, on this matter, this is a matter I've heard, and uh, sometimes people whisper to me that a woman had accused you, which is impossible. I was in jail, we were arrested the same night, and I've been detained. The information I'm giving on Yami now is that somebody, one of Taylor's bodyguards, had come to see me having to be my cousins. He saw the condition of the people. He found a way to where I was detained. And he was very, very sorry. He was in sympathy with me, thinking that I might not live because the way he saw the people treated Yomi. But then he further said, as the veil was not involved, as the veil was in the pickup, outside waiting for his friend Yomi, he has taken Yomi to his house to cook. They were cooking a soup that night. When, when somebody, some soldier from President Taylor had gone to look for Yomi, and the wife said, oh, Yomi had gone to Azevay's house. Then the car drove to where Azevay lives. So when they went and Azevay's wife 
went, I mean, as they were, you mean wife, say they go to as a, as a woman and where they are. But she was able to be jealous and to really go to girlfriend or so. But they went exactly, they were cooking their soup. So the security man who went and said, oh, you mean, uh, the chief is uh, calling for you, they wants to talk to you. But then, as they said, he would not stay. Yomi didn't have a car with him that night. He said, well, let me take uh, Yomi in my pickup. As I as said, well, well, let me go take my friend. And when the chief finished talking to him, so I can be able to bring him back so we can drink our soup. I think that was his involvement. Because when I was questioned that night, when I was arrested, he said, tell us, say, open it that the people were all arrested for different purposes. I was arrested for talking to the Americans. If I had to die, just what I was going to die for. And some people were trying to bring arms to Liberia through Cote d'Ivoire to overthrow the government. But nothing was said about Azevi when Taylor was talking to me directly. He did not mention Azevi. He mentioned Yomi. So the question here then is, what happened to Isaac V? Did he just disappear from the face of the earth? Surely people within your organization must know the information. Yeah, the people involved, who knows, but no. Do you know anything at all? But I was in jail, how will I know who took him? Did you hear anything? Yeah, people, people around town, people say he was in a pickup, and uh, the security boy went to him and said, why are you doing a pickup? And uh, those are rumors. And, uh, and they pick up, uh, they say, well, since you have seen the devil, you cannot go. And they put them in with you and took them away. And even with me, when the people arrived, at where they go, where they took them to, they took them to Nimba. And when they were there, and some of my own friends who were in the group said, oh, we thought that the VP they bring in. Like VP waiting to, to execute, then you go bring different people. Some of my friends, who I took them to be my friends, that's what they say there. Mm -hmm. But God, in heaven knows, I'm not on any. So any which part of Nima they took them? They told they took them to Ganta Way by, by the railroad and uh, what, what. That's what people are saying from time to time. The they name were, of any location? No. You no, know, I, I didn't go after that as you are saying. But, but if, if you check further, you will know because there was somebody sent. But I, I'm telling you that Benjamin Yeten was the one who called me to tell her that night to be arrested. So he arrested me. So the wife supposed to know who went to call Yomi that night. Yomi didn't, didn't fly from the sky. Mm -hmm. They were to say who carried a jeep to take them that night. I think there were investigations to start from. Who were those of your own friends that you talk about who has said they thought it was, it was the VP they were waiting for, but then instead it wasn't the VP. No, there was, there, was, there was no special person. They person were in the dark. And they person say, oh, they're that VP, that VP, that VP. And the, and the fellow may be afraid to name somebody to me. So you say, oh, some of your own friend against you. But I took that to be rumors, to be exact. He said, oh, the poor say, oh, we thought a VP or bringing to again. Zero in one time. He thought he know plenty. So what that, do you know, what did you hear about Samuel Duki and his family's uh, death? The same thing goes at rumors. Samuel Duki, vehicle was stopped in Kakata at the police station, at uh, Banga, at uh, Banga police station. And he was taken away by Benjamin Yeten, according to rumors. And the next day they found them dead on Kokoya Road. What did you hear, you, as a person, as one of the... Um well, what I heard, they took them, the, the, the wife was killed, the driver was killed, the Oki sister was killed, and, the, and another bodyguard was killed on, on, on Kokoya Road. That the, the, the explanation went, you know, when people are telling rumors, and we got no clue, I was not investigating the case, so I, and, uh, and they said somebody was arrested. They say a man was arrested, and they say somebody responded, and the person escaped and went to Iroquois, and wah, 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 so that, 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 it is. That what I heard. Okay, Mr. Witness, I'm asking you these questions. Yeah. Uh, we all heard 
rumors. Yes. But I'm asking you these questions against the background that, given your position in the organization at the time, you know, you are it, it, yeah, it is hoped that yes. you will have certain information that yeah, I, yeah. who is considered an ordinary person, will not have. You are so correct, that's why I'm asking this question. Commissioner, you are correct. You are correct. Okay. You, um, you said repeatedly that you, was, you were never a foot soldier. You didn't go to war. You, there was no reason to fight, um, etc. I will ask you a very direct question. Yes. We need to clearly understand what happened here. Mm -hmm. Did you at any time kill anyone? Did you shoot anyone? Did you kill anyone? Did you hurt anyone? Did you loot any property? Did you order any men under your command to hurt anybody, rape any, 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 any woman? Did you do any of these things? Directly that, or indirectly? Yeah, that, 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 that I cannot remember. I told you uh, a man was shot in, in, uh, in Ganta for looting the Lebanese and they killed the Lebanese. Then I told you again by another man who was shot in uh, Kipamas mm -hmm. for taking cap off another person's head. And one of my fighters went and then shot the man. And I called Banga to, to, to let her know that this seller has taken or uh, killing somebody for nothing for taking care of his head. And he said, they may not uh, investigate and prosecute equally. So that person was killed. Honestly, I was there. And why you can't kill anybody? That man was shot. And that other man with the Lebanese man in Ganda was also shot. And I was present. Okay, were you the one who investigated them or you were part of that Oh, no, I was, I was part of the team. I was Inspector General and I got a report from the headquarters. You know, I always report to the president why has happened in the field with such a serious crime that's involving human beings life and uh, the man was shot there was a board set up to investigate and he, he himself admitted and that there were three and uh, the one that looted the man and two of the fellow escaped through the windows and he, he was waiting for daylight to go a little he fell asleep and uh, he was there on the day, and he was caught. So you were never involved directly or indirectly in the killing of anybody, no. violation of anybody's human rights? None that you know? Well, no, to my knowledge, to be involved with shooting, my soldier, remember, I mean, it was, it was, I had a small group with me, and they were always with me. How many men do you remember? The group I had was about, they were first a platoon, sir, not platoon, a team, the five men. But later they came out to, I think, nine or ten. And with me in a pickup, in a small car. Even at some time, they, 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 they took some things from some people, or they were giving lifts to people who had looted from people's property. And I bust, I got angry, and I shut the car tire to put those dirty mattress down. And I said, they are my living witness. I said, if you loot people dirty things and put it in my car, I will not allow it. What is mattress that you cannot buy? You put people bloody things in my car. I never looted anyone. All directly. What do you know about Mr. Taylor's alleged involvement in the death of the former president of Burkina Faso, Thomas Sankara? Well, that's what I said here. We, we went to Libya in groups. And in my group, we were 22 men group. When we passed through Wakadugu, Thomas Sankara was still president of Wakadugu. I don't know what happened with the 47 man group, 36 man group, 23 man group that were at the rear coming. Because when we returned, when we returned from Libya and coming to Wagadugu, Thomas Sankara had been executed and Blaise were already president of, of Burkina Faso. Well, then that was... happened when we were in Libya already. Because we were the first 22 men to go. And by the time we passed through Waga, Wagadugu, 
Kama Sankara was president at that time. So with the grouping that follow me, they'll be able to explain better. I would just, um, I would ask a, um, a general question here. Uh -huh. You know, the TRC has been around the entire country and we've been consulting with all Liberians. Yeah. And um, there were several persons, civilians, including women as well, from Grand Jida County who we spoke with, some of them gave statement. Yeah. And they describe the condition or the situation with the county when the war started. And uh, one of them gave a description that I want to leave with you that when the MPFL captured Grand Jida County one night, they set towns and villages ablaze and when they came ran out of their, their homes the entire sky was red my question here is why was it necessary to on a scale like that um, target a county or civilians truly not everybody there was soldier and Grand Judea is part of Liberia as well. Why was it necessary when the NPF entered Grand Judea County to, um, to go on a rampage like that? That's another unfortunate situation you are talking about. I was not there. I was not along with a group that captured and burned. But I must admit that when I was passing through Grand Judea, I saw some burned houses and some places were not burned, but some were actually burned along the roadside, which is true. And when the MPFL had passed there at the time, and I must admit that happens, that that really happens, but it was very difficult to hold. And then by that time, because some of these people who did it, but it's not die in the process, because they were changing fire too. There were soldiers there, and most of the brave commanders who were when in people's houses or then die in the process. Because there were people in there with guns too. And many of them died. It was true that some places got burned. But then another thing happens. When another the second war came and the people of Grand Jida to turn on Nimba, they did where too, they did a lot of burning. And one time I told some people in my town, they were crying. I said, well, this, this situation, like I do me, I do you, because they, they burn Grand Jida too. And those boys who came with, 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 uh, with, with Model, they didn't play in him, but they burn other towns down and kill innocent people too. So it is good that this thing happened three hours since you know, and at least we, we say, well, let bargain be bargain to each other. So both sides burn. Mm. If you go to Tabata now, you see, you see there was a house there before. People are building ties, you know, little huts and things everywhere along the roadside. That's, that's the same thing with Grand Judea. Okay. My next question concerns the children of Nimba County. We keep hearing the story from everywhere repeatedly that there were about 100 or more children from Nimba County who were allegedly put in a well or taken away and killed during the early days of the war, when the war started by fighters, I mean by um, AFL soldiers. Yeah. What do you know about this incident and what really happened to the children? How many children were, were there? We, we, me, to be particular, I heard this thing by rumors and, and I saw, I saw people who were in the front line fighting, who saw the struck. Even some people, some women in Morovia, I tried to inquire whether this uh, information is correct. And some people told me it's correct that these people brought these children. They even decided to share some of these children with people. And say, look, you want, you, you want child come over, we'll give you one, I'll give you two. And the other rest, they had to dump it in the well somewhere, in the water. But some people actually took some away. And they said that was happening. I mean, it happens. It's true that it's happening. I would not say woman because one or two persons, three persons told me the story. So who were some of these uh, people at the time who, who, who did this, who were involved in taking these children away and 
Those are ASL soldiers, and some are living. They did all kinds of things to people here. This is why we mentioned that people why we went into exile and ended up into Libya, and that brought this war. That big things happened here. My first woman I ever married to got killed in the Lutheran church. Her two sisters, four children, her big brother, they all got brain. They died here. The woman, some people, some eyewitnesses that were in the Lutheran church, she cried all night. When somebody identified her, she was working at the executive mansion as secretary in Sanga Will's office. And one SS boy said, wow. This is Moses Blaworth, that one of the rebels that's supposed to be coming here, according to their security information. The woman said, no, this man is not with me anymore. And she was talking the fact. We went to Libya and she didn't know where we were because I was not communicating with her. They butchered that woman all night. She bled to death or crying for water. One of my cousins was that she hid in the ceiling. She's living by now. She's in my village. She's called Bo. What was the name of your, your wife? Cousin, the my the wife is uh, Viola. Viola Kanwen Bla. The one who was killed in the yeah, church? Yeah, Viola Kanwen. And the children, what happened to the children? You said she had children for you? No, the, my, my daughter was living with her. The, the children that were killed were her sister, three children. She died together with her children. And the very unfortunate thing that happened to her. She was in Bannersville. She had decided that night to come and cross into Kakata to me. Then she couldn't leave her sisters. So she said, well, I will sleep tonight in the Lutheran church. Then tomorrow I will take my sisters and then we can go on to Kakata and find our way. It was the night the massacre happened. That's how she died. Do you remember the name of her sister and, and if you knew the name of the children? That will take time. I know the sister, the two sisters' name, but the children' name I cannot remember. Can you give us the name of the sisters? One is called Golon. Can you repeat that again? One is called G-O-R-L-O-N. Oh, Golon. Okay. Her last name? It's called... Okay, if you don't remember today, can you, if yeah, when you... I will write the name. Yes, and send it yeah. to us, yeah, or to the TRC later, yeah, I will along send with the, the children. Name, yeah. I will the names and everything, I will get the whole thing. Okay. The bigger brother is also here working at the Freeport. I will talk to him. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> thank you very much, Mr. Witness. My name is uh, Commissioner John Stewart. Can you, um, in the, at the onset of the program, the chairman, in your, in presenting you to this panel, made mention of your membership in the AFL. When were you in the AFL and how long did you stay in the AFL? What was oh, your last rank? Oh, I'm very the sorry. AFL? I'm very sorry. I didn't uh, correct that when the chairman was talking. I was never in the uh, EFL. Okay, thank you very much. No, I was never in the EFL. Now, on the split in the MPFL with Prince Johnson, yeah. what can you tell us about the split? What were the reasons that led to that split? And what part did you have to play, or what part did you play in it? On which side did you uh, 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 align yourself? What, what, what happened with the split? As I said earlier, I was in Abidjan trying to see to, uh, to bring some uh, weapons. When I went, I didn't have money to pay for a truck. And I went, I heard that uh, Prince Johnson had broken away. And that when the Barclay fellow came and told Taylor that I have taken the arms and sent them over to Prince Johnson. So when I was calling him for this uh, investigation, that when I knew 
the parents are broken away, he has his own group. So that, that, that nothing to my knowledge. What caused him to split? And uh, I, I cannot say that. Thank you. Now, if we should move, uh, if we should move a little further. As Inspector General of the MPFL, yeah, and a top-ranking officer, what can you tell us about Operation Octopus? Who were the planners? Who were the strategists? And who were the main commanders in the field? Well, when it comes to Octopus, I said I was in Kipamas. I was, I almost became superintendent of Maryland County. So I was peeing down there. I knew Octopus were going on. I listened to radio. We have our communication. But not to my knowledge should tell you that I knew when they were planned, who were the commanders, who took over what, who part this play. It was a diff difficult for me to tell you. So you had no part to play in that? No. I was, I was on the other side of Liberia, in the southeastern region. Okay, uh, so what can you also tell us about the Carter Camp Massacre? Mm -hmm. If you have an idea. The massacre at uh, Carter Camp in Harbell. No, that's the same. Carter Camp, I was in a here, I question with Carter Camp, and uh, I was question also about the Dupo Road Massacre. No, I was, oh, I was in Kipamas. So you don't know anything about those? No. Now, um, When you, you mentioned about your role in the MPFL, serving in the southeastern part of the country, yeah. in the Maryland area, yeah. specifically. Yes. Now, uh, tell us what do you know about the killing of the former superintendent of uh, <clears throat> Maryland County, D.Y. Nair, cool. and uh, Roland Nair, and... Uh, to so the best of your recollection, yes. Who was uh, Brooks Gonkano? Brooks Gonkano was uh, one of the commanders there previously, before I went and took over. Brooks Gonkano was there, and uh, one Gil Devil was there, and I think. From the killing of this people, I went uh, were ordered to move into Kipamas immediately. When I went to Kipamas, that uh, the incident has uh, just occurred, and the people were all hanging on me to bring these people. So I said, no, they have been arrested and sent to Banga. And uh, D.Y. Nair West used to come to me and another daughter. And then one of them I missed was um, son Lato. Son Lato was not his son there. He had gone there for a visit. He is the one caused all of this trouble. Son Lato, the same man I said that he killed some people in uh, Grand Jude, in the administrative building. It is Saint Lato who had gone to Kipamas that night. According to what the people reported to me. He is the one who really instigated all this killing and hurting of this man on his eye. There is an old man who had a glasses on. Because I went to his house when I took over as commander. I went to his house. I saw his wife. And we became friendly. They used to come to me. So what did you do to prevent the, the actions of this uh, Sam Lato? Sam Lato was reported and sent to Banga. He was arrested. The other fellow too was died on his back, it he remained in the back of a car from, from, from Kipamas to Morovia. I sent them to Banga. And what happened to uh, Brooks uh, Gonkanu? Well, Brooks, Brooks escaped and he ran. Brooks was not arrested by me, but he disappeared the scene because I all around looking for him. He has already gone to Banga. Then so, I called by radio to present tell her that the Brooks were already in Banga. So Brooks Gonkanu was one of those responsible for the killing of uh, Mr. D.Y. and others? No, the D.Y. was not clear to me. 
what I said, I was Hosan Rato responsible. Because a woman came to me, and the name that the woman called to me was San Lato, who had beaten the old man and passed his glasses on the man's face. So what kind of actions can you attribute to this Gonkano Brooks? He's, he did not commit any such atrocity, as you say. Oh, uh, no, I, I cannot say no. Because they were there before me. Previous, previously, they were commanders there. So why all the dead there before I got there, I won't say. Because I was, I was ordered to, to, to arrest and send them. Now, as Inspector General of the MPFL, yes. especially in that area, were you aware that uh, a lot of atrocities were being committed by MPFL forces in the area? Yeah. Yeah, on uh, that name, DY name incident, another woman, a pregnant woman, well, all before I got there, the another woman pregnant was uh, across, uh, killed across a river, someplace. Those that were reported to me. Does the name of General Sumo ring a bell to you? Yeah, good. He was also there. Good. He was also. And Paul Doe, the late. Paul V. Paul Doe, not V. Not V. Paul Doe. How not Paul Doe? Paul Doe. No, can't remember that. I think he's from the area there. He's from Kipamos, I think. But was uh, Paul V active in that area? Paul V went there lately. They went there and they were driven by the war. And they all jumped on one old ship in Kingdom Morovia. So they were not very active there. Now, you mentioned about the death of the former vice president Enoch Dougalier. Yeah. And uh, you said that as far as you were concerned, the information that you have was that he was ill and he yes. died from his illness. Yes, that's what I heard. Now, was this illness natural or was it induced? Did you hear anything about him being wrapped in the mattress and beaten at the farm of uh, the former president Taylor? Well, I heard the story but when I met, when I, when I came from Libya, I, I, I went to Firestone, the last place he was, before taking to uh, Abidjan, was uh, Dusa Hospital. And I went to the hospital, not Dusa, to uh, Habel Hospital. I went to Habel, he was not talking anymore. And he was just rolling and rolling and rolling. And I shared here, you know, being my friend, and he was not talking only a bodyguards around him and waiting for a plane for him to go. So, I, I didn't check his body. I didn't see bruises to say he was beaten. Somebody didn't even pinch me to say, well, look, uh, yeah, your brother, you were beaten so, so by this person. So, nobody said that to me. But I met him. He was breathing. He wasn't talking. And he was taken to Abidjan. But uh, can you recall that during the night of his wake, his wife, while mourning and crying, yeah. openly said that there were those who there were people responsible for his death. No, not the man. Don't recall that. No. Now, you talk about the killing of Sam Bokari and that you saw his body in and around somewhere in Nimba. Yeah, Kukupa. Kukupa. I mean, now Kukupa saw me camp. So in the vicinity of Kokopa. Yeah, right. Now, according to the information we have, yes. talking to many sources, yes. there were a lot of killings that went on in Kokopa. Were you aware of any of these killings that went on? Koko, uh, yeah, in, 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 in that area. It is true that a lot of killings went on. There's a creek coming to Ganta and where the other road, where the railroad bridge is to go to Ganta and the other road going left. I drove there one day myself going to my village. I saw a body full of body in the water. And, and, and I felt very bad and the play was, I had to one of my glasses from the car before I could pass there. And there were people who signed there and they were checking people, looting and taking money from people. That was what, that what I heard. That was at Kokopa? Yeah. Now, now, now Kokopa saw me junction. 
CNC camp junction. CNC camp. Uh, yeah, that was a lot of people died there. That's true. But we also understand that Kukupa was a staging area that uh, Benjamin Yeti and others would come, they would stop, they would sleep, and there were operations, there were killings going on there. Were you not aware of any of this? Because I understand you are from Blood Yala, are you? Yeah, Blood Yala. That is not too far from the Kukupa area. No, but Blood Yala is very far from Kukupa. We, when you talk about Blood Yala, you're talking about beyond Tapeta. Or oh, beyond Tapeta. Yeah, right. Okay, but that Kukupa was a staging area. Who was the... The, 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 the officer in charge of the Kukopa plantations. Kukopa never had a, a, a who was the superintendent of the plantation? The superintendent was Harrison Kamwe. Was Harrison Kamwe aware that killings were going on in his assigned area, that such there, things were happening? This I wouldn't say. But one time Kamwe told me that his one of his brothers got killed there too, was shot by an MBFL soldier. I don't know why this person was shot and who shot him. I think you would be the best person to say. So, would you say that he had any role at all in any of this? No. He had Kamwe, no role? No. Kangwe was just a civilian doing a rubber business. And those days, what was happening, even if you are, if you are a civilian and these soldier boys came on you with force and they say, Chief said this person must stay here. And you compare to a common dead that person. We all were living in fear. So Kamwe, I don't think Kamwe is connected with any killing. He might have some information, but I don't think he was. The kind of person I know. So, so to, the best of your, to the best of your knowledge and recollection, yeah. uh, where was Sam Bokeri actually killed? And who do you believe killed others to have him killed? This is another difficult question. Sam Bogaria entered Liberia already. He was living in Kukupa. In in uh, in the camp, in the Kukupa camp, in a house belonging to Harrison Kamwe. The man has evacuated his own house to move to another building because Sam Bogari was there. According to what he told me. But then the night they passed through my village and said they were going for patrol. And I tried to tell my chief that this man was killed when after passing my village. And he said, I should forget about it because this is a military business. And that same day when the defense minister came out to announce that this man was forcing his way into Liberia and he got shot. Now, you mentioned that when former President Taylor went to Ghana, yeah. and was uh, handed the indictment and later returned to Liberia, yeah. uh, you were accused of having attempted to unseat his government. Yes. And you mentioned that you were called either to the mansion or to, to the White, White Flower, and yeah. where you went, you met the full cabinet. Yeah, to his residence, yes. Was Yomi in that meeting? John Yomi. John Yomi, was he present? No, Yomi wasn't there. Was there ever a time when Mr. Taylor, or former President Taylor, took a knife and stuck it in the eyes of John Yomi while you were present? In your presence? Did it happen? Those are rumors I heard. Those are rumors I wasn't there. I, we were not caught together. I was arrested before and taken to a place where I was detained. And this boy who came to me this is a fellow who told me this nasty story and said, Lord, I will hope God will bless you. But what we saw it is, 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 is it you cannot believe with your, with your eyes to see somebody being treated like that. So it wasn't the same day that this cabinet meeting was held? Was it the same day or the next day or the no, previous the same day? day? The, the, the same day? No, no, no. They had the same day I arrested. Who were some of those present in that cabinet meeting that you remember God, that are still here? The full cabinet of Mr. Taylor was present. The full cabinet? The full cabinet of Mr. Taylor government were present. And some legislators too were present. And now you don't know whether you, you're saying that you're not sure because according to what I gather, yes. when you were taken to that meeting, Mr. Yomi was not there. No. 
But did, did you hear whether he had been taken to that meeting previously and questioned before you got there or but after you had left? No, they, I think they got there after me. After you? Yeah, I was there earlier. And the boy who came to me, he had just left the meeting and had gone to where they had been detained. He was in search of me. And was after he had seen this kind of action, that when he was around looking for me, thinking that they have taken me away already. So he said we should pray. The thing he saw, and and and, and he mentioned how how our leader said, "Oh, you man, you have you are known for killing president. I will be the last president you will kill." Was this before dark or after dark? It was. It was. It was dark. All of this thing happened in the night. Now, who are some of those cabinet ministers and legislators that you remember seeing in that room when you were taking there? To, to be frank with you, uh, Commissioner, I was kind of confused. This is a president who is my friend and my boss. I, I came in a car and I was taking a more large group of people and, and I was never given a seat. And I was standing with my hand behind me and said, you, that you want to overthrow my government, you will see your injustness. I'll teach you a lesson. Did, uh, any, did any of the cabinet ministers or any of the legislators, did any of them see anything nobody in objection? Said, nobody said a word. Nobody said a word. You, it, you, can you remember any face that you may have seen there? It, it, that, that you might think that I'm talking this thing or anything. That I wish to know who I were for till about. The four cabinet was there. The place was full. The place, no, everybody was sitting down. It was like they too were a little bit shocked. Because to see a man, you call your vice president to be treated like that, standing among these people, having burst into tears, I was confused. Very, very confused. To say I identify a special person, whether they say or they did not say. No. They, were, they were not an easy period for me. Now, while the former president was in Ghana, uh, awaiting his return yeah. to Monrovia, yeah. did you and uh, Benjamin Yetin have any discussions? Did no. he express any fears to you? No. And th at the time, did you have any feeling that Mr. Taylor was going to come back or that he was not going to come back and that you found yes. yourself in yeah. a very difficult situation? I knew my wife was in Ghana with the president. My wife my wife was very close to the president. My wife knew exactly. My wife called me when they were going to the conference hall. My wife called me when they did the announced indictment. My wife called when the Ghana government offered him a plea when John Kufu, who is also our friend, a friend of my family, told the people, say, look, if you want to arrest Taylor, it cannot be done here on my soil. You can arrest it in your country. So he changed the plan that was supposed to give uh, that that took Taylor and uh, in his own uh, presidential jet that brought Taylor here. And my wife was on the phone with me, telling me what was unfolding. That way, when the people came to me to go to announce to Liberian people what was happening in Ghana, I said, no, I will not accept I got an authority from the president of Liberia. I'm hoping that he's returning soon. And when the American embassy charged affair called me that they were in fear, the, the notorious ATU were on a rampage and they were afraid for that night. And I said the same, that the president is on his way, he will soon be here. But we are, I'm outside together with the, the, the chief of security, who is Benjamin Yetin. Don't have fear. Situations are under control. That was I told the American charged affair that night. Now, does the name Zigzag uh, Mazza ring a bell to you? Yeah, I know Zigzag well. You know him well. Fair what, well. Kind of, what kinds of activities do you know him to have been involved with? Ziza Mazza, tough soldier man with Benjamin Yetin, a serial bodyguard of Benjamin Yetin, and working for Unico Jungle Fire. That's the kind of man he. That's the unit that was based in the Foya area? In the Foya area. Exactly. Now, and that unit was brought to Monrovia during uh, 2003. Exactly, sir. And had the headquarters on the Capitol Bypass. I say, Commissioner, you, you, you answer my question, sir. 
All right, now, knowing Zigzag Maza, yeah. who, according to a number of witnesses that have appeared before us, was key in several massacres, um, do you know anything of his involvement in blood sacrifice along with uh, Charles Taylor? Yeah. Eating human parts, drinking human blood? No. What, what, what I should know about Caesar Massa, he was very, very close to Benjamin Yaten. For him being very close to President Taylor, that, that not to my knowledge. But he was very, very close to Benjamin Yaten. Very, very close. But, but Benjamin you, Yaten cannot move without Caesar Massa. Are you aware that at any time uh, 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 a pregnant woman was allegedly buried in a pit, in a hole, in the yard of Mr. Taylor's home in Conga Town, and a sheep sacrifice not, was made on top of the woman. Were you aware of that? No, not to my knowledge. Not aware of that. Not, not to my knowledge. But were you aware that there were cannibalist, cannibal, uh, cannibalistic practices by MPFL fighters, eating human parts, drinking human blood, and all of that? Were you aware of that? <coughs> that there were some no. MPFL officials or some. Uh, in a top hierarchy were involved in, uh, in human and blood sacrifice? What, 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 no, that uh, drinking the blood, no. But what I saw, it is one time uh, I was ordered to arrest a fellow, one of the uh, generals, that I've forgotten his name, my God. He was in the German camp area. There was a report that he killed some people crossing from Bikiana. And I was asked, Taylor ordered that I should go and bring this boy to Banga. I hesitated for a while, but he pressed me so much to go because this is a man with a terrible character. I will call his name later in the step of mind. When I entered his camp, I saw them eating cassava, roasted cassava, <laughs> with a, a palm of a human being where they are taking his skin off and the gas here, the poor pepper and thing, you know, and he was smoking opium, he smoked, he said, that is sweet, chief, that kind of thing, you eat it before, I said, I beg you, I just came, please, <laughs> let us go to Banga. He said, but you can't investigate the matter here. Not knowing along the road there were ambush set for me, if I say he's guilty, and trying to take him up by force, they were going to fire my car. So, Who was this commander? Uh, I will call his name. Nixon Gay. The late Nixon Gay. The late Nixon Gay. Who was who was his immediate deputy? My God. That was uh, Melvin Subani ever attached to that particular unit? Yeah, but Subani was not there when I went to uh, arrest Nixon Gay. But he served with that unit. Yeah, they were all in the German camp. So you think he may have been aware that such eating of human beings was... This, uh, this, this I cannot say because I have not seen. But I saw a nation gay beating the palm of a man, then putting it on fire and cutting it and, you know, gashing it. And I, I, I was uncomfortable to stay there for a minute. So I left. I said, look, we have to go. He said, you got to judge the matter. Then one of the boys came to me, being a girl boy, he said, chief, this place, that dangerous place here. You, you got your headquarters, you kill the poor banger, you go and talk the matter. Secretly, he told me. So they can say, we'll talk the matter. But so, a, so, but just a minute. So I told Nathan Gay, I said, no, let's go into the matter. He said, I kill nobody. The poor king, I saw my soldiers, they were fighting my soldiers, and they died in an accident. So I said, good. There's a time they die, jealous from a bruised car, they die, all right. What I want you to do with me, come with me in the car. You can explain it to the chief. The thing you're talking, say, I think you're right. The thing they just lie on you, I think you're right. He said, okay, let me put on my clothes, go. He told three of the bodyguards, they joined me in my car. When we enter Banga, chief was cutting his hair at the back of the house. Then he said, oh, I went and saluted, say, well, I brought Nathan Gay. He said, I Nathan come. When Nathan got there, the way he called through three of his strong bodyguards. Was Cassius Jacobs among them? Well, I will call this one. This he got, he died later. He, uh, he died in Ganta. He called a boy. 
you say, well, you are going to MP headquarters and bring me five strong MP. When they kill the MP kid with a car, they, they kill well armed. Nelson getting a gun. When he entered the house, they disarmed him before coming. He said, You are tired, of motherfucker. You kill people. They go lie to the inspector say you kill them. I tell the man. And when they died, nursing gay and took him to MP headquarters. That night, they carried him. But uh, I told you, I said, this thing, you put me in Dinya with nursing. You got to never go on a base. And nursing gay, no, I brought him here. I got one time I met him in Ganta, he was chasing a car, running behind. I stopped the car among the people in the market. I said, why is it that you're running behind my car? I jumped down from the car. He said, you see me running behind your car? You see me running behind your car? So I said, my man, don't play that you fun with me. I had some people do with me. No boys got down. When they were gone, they were waiting. I watched him here myself. But I will end up dying. And he went away and I went away. But he was not too good with me until he died. So, uh, but what the measures that uh, President Taylor take, so he let him go? Was he punished? I think he was punished. He was put into jail. Usually the punishment uh, President Taylor gives to these uh, strong fighters and things is they send you to the front line, to the hot line, to go and fight there for a while. Since you are involved in doing this thing and know how to kill people, go to so, go Vanyama or go to Foya and go and go fight. And that's the kind of punishment that I know of. So, so, so in other words, the life of people was nothing. No. Okay. If we move on, as Inspector General of the uh, MPFL, what can you tell us about the death of Digbon, who was his first uh, Minister of Lands and Mines uh, in the MPFL? Yeah, Digbon. Did, did he did he train with you in uh, Libya? Yeah, right. Dibon is uh, one of the recruiting officers for NPFL. Excuse me, Commissioner. Let me check on something. I tried to mention that earlier. Good. Uh, you talk about Dibon. Dibon, Dibon, Obe, William Obe, Dibon Godfather. They were the three recruiting officers we had. Dibon was very educated persons. He a geologist, and uh, when they start to work, being a geologist, he was assigned into Bummy Hills. He was in Bummy Hills with Oliver Varney and other people in Bummy Hills. Wow, I was across the country on the other side. So how he got arrested, but I knew he was executed. What sort of investigation he went on and well, No, not to my knowledge. Well, so, I know he got killed. So who ordered his execution? Well, according to rumors, they said he was involved in a coup d'etat. He wanted to overthrow President Taylor. He was investigated and guilty, found guilty and died. And was he tried? Him? Was he brought before court and tried? What? That, 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 that was the rumor I heard. That why I'm saying rumor. So I didn't go to that court, that trial, such an educated person. And well, what is your certain knowledge as uh, uh, adjutant general and uh, inspector general? What is your certain knowledge of his death? What well, this, this I say, if you can compare that Roman detention here, I would say it's illegal because I was arrested here, vice president, taken to jail for no due respect. A second man in the country went into jail and went into one squeeze of room and and was detained for eleven days. So I mean if, if anybody should be killed in such a manner, I would say illegal because I was detained illegally. How about uh Jackson Doe, Stephen Yekerson, Moses Dupu and others? What were the circumstances of their death? Who ordered the executions? Jason Doe, the rumors again, Jason Doe was killed in the harbor area. While you were running to safety, we left Morovia and were going towards our area, our control area. 
he was arrested on the order of who I don't know and was executed. So he and was arrested, he was killed while under detention. Yeah. So can we so can we conclude that the yeah. FBI leadership yeah, can be responsible for his death? Of, of course. He had entered our area already. And when let's say Moses Dopu, you had just mentioned, Moses Dopu has come from Nigeria and he started to come to our camp in Bobley. That when he was also investigated, according to rumors, that Moses Dopu was investigated. And what he said in the investigation that uh, he went to Nigeria and mentioned to some high, you know, military officials in Nigeria that he was part of National Patriotic Front of Liberia, who they say he shouldn't say so because he was not a part of this organization. So that when they found him guilty, he was also executed. With his brother, Moses Dobu had a big brother living in the Cote d'Ivoire in a in a, in a town called Barry. Bright men with beautiful children. Very beautiful guys. I think some are in a university of Abidjan right now. How about um, how about uh, 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 Stephen Nicholson, Stephen Daniels? Stephen Daniels then were picked up in Kakata together with my father, my uncle. David Towe, who taught, who took me to school. They were, I told you that was Afro Flomo, that the superintendent, the Daniel, and that was David Towe. So again, it's the MPFL leadership that MPFL we can MPFL leadership. Who are those in the top leadership that you can say, maybe what, the top 10? What, what happened in this case, I mentioned that earlier also. When I saw David Towe tied in the police headquarters in Kakata, he cried on me. He said, oh, you me here, my son. So I ordered the people to loose him. And I told the, com the commanders that night, said that this is my father. You can't treat my father like that. Loosen the woman. He loosened the man. I told his wife to go and uh, go to Bright Farm, pay for chicken, to cook cassava leaf for him. He loved to eat cassava leaf. So in that process, Somebody came from Habel and said, President Taylor wants to see you. So I told the woman, I said, look, don't cry. Since you are seeing me, you safe. Let me go to Habel. Let me face the chief. I took my pickup. I drove to Habel. When I said, chief, did you send for me? He said, he said, no, I didn't send for you. I said, but chief, I mean, the boys from here came and said, you sent for me. So I said, okay, sir, say you didn't send for me. The boy brought my father, and the way he was treated, I didn't like it. He tired the old man. He said, who your father? Who your father? I said, well, my father, David Toy. Senator Toy. Then he said, well, but he said, David Toy said, man, the man, they were in my room there calling me Rook. They were in one newspaper my sister brought here, and they said, the man, uh, uh, Rook, I uh, stole money, and one well, my criminal. And in fact, he's my brother in law. Nothing will happen to him. Don't worry. You will be okay. So I said, Chief, then I'm leaving, sir. He said, All right. By the time I got to Kakata Police Station, I saw a woman who was selling a water market. And the woman called me, true sign. I went and said, Oh, the woman not here again. Then I, they took three of them away in one car, in one pickup. But ever since they took them, the pickup came back. We didn't see them. So I went in there, I, I, I looked around, nothing. So I came back to my car. So, so from that, can we conclude that... Uh, I they were dead. They that, were, they that, were, their deaths were ordered by Mr. Charles Taylor. Well, I, they said... Or that he can take responsibility for yeah, the because deaths. Because he mentioned that to me, that this man I accused him of being a criminal. But he knew they were in custody, right? He knew that. He knew that, but he told me that. So I told him, he said, well, these people... What happened is that this man accused me also, but then he assured me again that nothing will happen to this man. This man is his brother-in-law. He will make sure that nothing happened to him. I shouldn't worry. That's the last word to me. How about the death of Elmer Glare Johnson? Elmer Glare Johnson 
who was a strong American soldier who we met in Libya. He's the first librarian that was brought to Libya by, by, by former President Taylor, Glad Johnson. He was introduced to us while in training and uh, that he a soldier, he had three American Marines and uh, he would be working with us in Liberia. What is, uh, who is he brought? Tom Oyu was also brought in to be introduced to us. He was operating from uh, America. They were helping the MPFL also. But then when we came here to fight, I was staying in Bobley. They first arrested on me. Glad Johnson was in Bobley when I was arrested that night. And I saw him and uh, he spoke to me briefly. And what he told me was, Oh Moses, uh, we hope that God bless you. When you show you're not involved in anything, you did not give the arms to Prince Johnson. We will find that out later. That was my last time talking to Glad Johnson. He left and went on to Pekana Highway behind uh, Firestone where he was sound. So the next rumor we heard that he was ambushed and died. What an enemy killed him, what an AFL group killed him, I, I, I don't know that. Now you mentioned that <clears throat> when uh, the late David Tua was in detention, yeah. and you tried to intervene on his behalf, a message came to you from Habel. Yeah. When you got to Habel, yeah. where, where was Mr. Taylor living when you reached Habel? Where was he living? Was he living in a so he what type of house, or was he living in no, a that, company house? I had that, that place called Up the Hill, where that, that narrow place you have to drive around the Habel Hill. Yes. Yeah, way up the top of the hill, where he was living. Who provided him such accommodation? Was it Forest to Management? Well, that I wouldn't know. Well, I know the commander in chief of National Patriotic Firm was living up there. Was Forest Tomb Plantations Company operational at the time Mr. Taylor was there? No, everything came to a standstill, but Forest Tomb employees were there. So the staff members were there. But they were not in the house, they were around. They yeah. were. But then people were not actually working. Can you recall if ever the Forest Tomb Management uh, asked Mr. Taylor to leave their property? Or. He remained there with their blessings. What happened when I was there very briefly? I was there when the day thing happened. I was a little bit uh, upset. I was not, you know, I'm not breaking away. But I slowed down my operation when, when, when David got killed. They, they worked on my mind. So uh, I won't say what happens after I left and what happened to, to Taylor while he was there. Now, there are some Nigerian journalists who were at the embassy in 1990 when the uh, fighting approached uh, Monrovia. Yeah. And according to information we have, they were arrested and taken, and taken to Banga and placed in detention. Were you aware of this? No. You were not aware? No. You not. never heard anything about any Nigerian journalist being in detention in Banga? I heard a Nigerian journalist. What did you hear about them? He was arrested. But I was in Kipamos then. And what did you hear they were taking? And what were the cause of their deaths? Well, I didn't investigate to say where they were taken to. Uh, what I heard on our radio, that some journalists were spying and they were arrested. They were arrested? Yeah. So we can conclude that the MPFL leadership yeah, of course, they were arrested by MPFL. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, while you were with the MPFL, there were several foreign nationals, some of them reported to be mercenaries, some regular troops from the Bukinabi army. But you are aware though that there were some regular troops from the Bukinabi army that came to fight alongside the MPFL, are you? No, not, not to my knowledge. Well, the, the, the president of uh, Burkina Faso, Blaise Kampaore, admitted in an interview with Jeune Afrique that he did send a battalion of Bukinabi commandos to fight alongside the MPFL in Liberia. Did you serve alongside any of those men or did you know any of them? What, what really matters, not to my knowledge, in a sense that I know a man called Dr. Mani. He's from the Gambia. 
a friend of Taylor came and he was in Habel. And but a lot of you know foreigners were there and it was it was difficult for me. I was in and out. I was not a stationary commander to be fighting with people to know who they are, but they were purely foreigners that were there and they were based in there. So that was making things difficult to answer your question, you know, directly. So Dr. Manning, is he the same as Kukwe Samba Samyang who That's the man who attempted to overthrow the Gambian in government? In Gambia, that's the man. He was here briefly with us and later he left. So where is he now? When did he leave Liberia? Oh, he left ever since he left. I cannot remember. He left. He had a little quarrel with uh, former President Taylor. He was becoming very powerful. He had his own group. He has his unit. And, and uh, President Taylor did not like that. What happened to the members of his unit? Well, they used to call Gambian Union or Gambian Force or what. And they were very powerful fellows. So they left. And the day confusion started until I didn't like him around him. And he left. And uh, I think he's in Ghana today as I was speaking to in him. In Ghana? In Ghana. Were there other foreign nationals fighting alongside the MPFL that you can remember? Besides uh, Gambians? Were there, for instance, we know that there were Sierra Leoneans as public record from the REF. But were there other nationals? Were there Guineans, for example? Were there Ghanaians? Were there Nigerians? Were there Senegalese? Were there other nationals? No, I would say when the, you're almost called Sierra Leonean, when you say Sierra Leonean, Sierra Leonean was uh, fighting alongside with us, that uh, for the Sankar connection, and, um, and uh, for the Gambians, they were also there. They were, they were fighting alongside, that I know of. Did you know Fode Sankar personally? Yes. When was the first time you met him? Uh, the first time I met Fode Sankar was in Libya. Fode Sankar, almost at the end of our training, had gone to Libya with about seven, eight men and, uh, to train. And according to him, he had been oppressed the people are suffering, and he wanted help from Gaddafi. But he was not taken seriously. But seven men, eight men, can now work through a government. So even though he was accommodated, and they came at one time, he was in the kitchen making tea for us, for, because I was, I was on the table, adjutant, you know, general. I used to order him to make tea for me and all of that. And uh, later we, we left. We left. We were almost coming to Liberia now. We left. We, we, we and what left. time did he join you in Liberia? What if it was that difficult for me to say? Because I was, I was left at the rear. But did you see him in Banga anytime living in Banga? Yes, he came to Banga on one or two occasions. How long uh, did he live there, to the best of your knowledge? Ah, uh, no. He wasn't living there. When we met the last time I met him was um, he was in Banga and uh, he had come to see uh, President Taylor on some something that was uh, making a little bit annoyed. And he did not explain to me in detail. But he was in Banga. So are you aware that Mr. Furisanko the late and others from the uh, MPFL attacked Sierra Leone? Were you in the planning of that operation? No. Mama Zingi Pama and I in the planning. Did you at any I time? I knew, I knew, I knew they would. Did you at any time go to the front lines to inspect no. that area of operation? No, no. That, that, was, that was very far from me. I was in Kipama at that time. I was superintendent of Kipama. I'm um, in mean Maryland. So your authority did not extend no. to that far? No, to, to that far, no. You were far from him. Now, uh, I just want to go back a little bit yeah. to Benjamin Yeten. Mm -hmm. How did he leave the country? When did he leave? Who organized his departure? Where did he go to seek uh, asylum? Where is he presently? Uh, to be frank with you, Benjamin left on our president. 
he left with the president you say i say he left when i was president of liberia yes did you officially authorize his departure from liberia yes in a sense that benjamin was not accused by anybody and uh he had jailed me he brought me from jail every night he on my wet feet hey ma tell your husband oh, the thing here that Latila ordered me to jail a old man so i told my wife tell benjamin he should forget about this thing i'm not thinking about how i went to jail since god has blessed me and nothing happened to me i put that behind me he shouldn't bother me with that one evening he came to me that uh anything i want to do for me you can do i said no 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 i what well, i have security in place here on me i mean echo more here people are protecting me then he said like, chief please permit me to go to ghana and and drop my children they will go to school and i'll return next week and you agreed i agree, I did, agree. You, did you provide him with a uh, with a diplomatic passport no 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 he has his own passport he has his passport he has all his traveling document he has his money to go so i said well do not stay a long time and you have to come back but then the reason i allow him to go also where there were no formal complaints from anybody to me and benjamin was a very dangerous man to just keep him around me and until i was living well let me tell you the fact that happened to me then before he left for my president left he asked me he said what happened was my security people you know they were low standard people so i should let his senior body guy come and take over my security including benjamin so i said i said gee i'm sorry these boys still need to be promoted they have been with me for years three years as vice president if i just change them overnight and bring in strange people they would not be happy so that let, let, let your security be there and uh, when the government change they can go to be with the uh with the new government but let my security stay with me so they were not on serious assignment with me i used to protect myself and i gave him special instruction to my bodyguards that when i'm in my room and i retired in bed the man not come closer to my door so when the man security was closer to my door so when benjamin asked that he was going for a while there was also a relief for me that he was taking his children away i said fine at least the guy let him push a little bit let him get <laughs> because i know who benjamin here is so he can't be with me i'm sleeping then benjamin said that to my door and so what happened when he changed so you're happy to see him go <laughs> you're happy to see him go yeah happy i'm happy but he was not going to sense that with my concern that i'm going to stay he said he was going to carry his children to go to school and i agree and i was i was happy too because uh, benjamin is staying with me because every night he's there and you're, he's you're understood the fear yeah is there playing with my children and things at the ego I, I used to tell my wife i said hey. i said nato the boy i have a good boy so nato will laugh 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 I said, <laughs> so um in other words while you may not have wanted to see him go yet you were happy that he left yeah so where is he presently he benjamin yes have you made any contact with him since no contact i don't know where he is ras roma had it they say benjamin was in uh, togo the uh, the son of uh, this uh, little uh, togolese uh, president is his friend and there where he is and the last story i heard from his former girlfriend is that he has grown his beard he he bleached his skin he is very bright and he has a very terrible beard like a like a muslim man the, the guy said if you see benjamin you will not know him so that that's the information i got okay uh, we should just move on 
Now, as Inspector General of the MPFL, yeah. were you aware of any units in the MPFL known as the bandits? Please come in, uh, Jim. I mean, uh, were you aware of any uh, units operating under the umbrella of the MPFL, a unit known as the bandits? Oof. No. In other words. Well, I can't. I can't remember. Now, as now, can you tell us about the operation of death squads in the MPFL? Were you aware that uh, there were operational death squads in the MPFL, and even during the time of uh, of the elected government, were you aware that there were? There were death squads in existence. You're not aware. No. Now, as a member of the MPFL, the fighting unit, how did you and others along with you receive the news of the death of Doe? Did it have any impact on the morale of the fighting men as yeah we'll fight more or this or that it was now time to to stop the fighting. What was the feeling then? What really happened when Doe died? Personally, I think I remember the former president Tiller saying he regretted that Doe had to die that way. He said what he thought was to capture Doe and put him in jail and investigate him. But the way he was captured and murdered, he didn't like the idea. And he, he, he spoke that, I mean, I heard that in a conversation with him. We all regret it. Okay, if I should move on. Can you tell us? Talking about the MPFL, you mentioned that when you started off, started off in Libya with a few men and they came by in groups, <clears throat> subsequently returned to Liberia, and there others joined the MPFL, some with different motives and intentions and all of that, some exactly. with the aim of getting rich and all of that. Yeah. But at the time you became vice president. By that time, who can you say were the 10 most influential members of the MPFL, MPP, by the time you became vice president? Yes. Who can you say were the 10 most powerful in terms of Mr. Taylor's inner circle? Who were they? Who are they? I said people were in government and... Uh he has his own cabinets and members and people he trusted were in his government working with him. Who were some of those that he trusted most? Say about the, 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 the most trusted ten of his inner circle. <laughs> it, it, I, I cannot answer this question because if a man has a trust in somebody he had to keep it to himself. I won't be the one to say why well, he trusted this man, he trusted that man. Was, can you say, for example, was Mr. John T. Richardson one of them? John, Richard, John T. Richardson was in government. He was the advisor. Was he one of those trusted men? Yeah, he was, he was, he was advisor to national security. Mr. Kuku Dennis, was he one of those trusted no, men? No, Kuku Dennis was a uh, soldier. Uh, he was in Bikina, one of the frontline commanders in Bikina. And fighting that area too. Mr. Benin Ayure. Uh, Benin Ayure was a uh, maritime commissioner when I was uh, vice president to President Charles Tiller. I hope I'm not going to jail for that question you asked him. Mr. Oscar Cooper, otherwise known as Captain Marvel. Yeah, uh, he was a businessman and uh, he was doing his logging, but also friend to President Tiller. Mr. Siri Allen. Yeah, he was. He was. He's also my friend, and he was also the friend of a president. He was uh, the chairman for our party. 
Mr. Thomas Woyu. Thomas Woyu was um, the Prime Minister for the National Patriotic Front. He had been a very strong man back in the NPFL. Was he a member of the inner circle by the time you became uh, vice president and later uh, president? No, Tom, you had left and gone to America, and uh, he was in other America. And uh, I think something happened that brought dissatisfaction to him between he and the President Taylor. That I won't know in detail. Uh, those are all the names that you, uh, can you can you remember any other names that you can point to? Like what? Who did I? Like Mr. Nyondwe Monokomna, for example. Yeah, Nyondwe Monokomna was, uh, when I was president of the Liberian Senate, he was a speaker. And uh, he was a, also a friend to the president. Mr. Daniel Chair. Daniel Chair also was a defense minister. Who was responsible for domestic security? National security? Yes. Um... Richardson was a vassal on national security, national and international security. So, to know exactly who was fully in charge of national security, I won't know. Is the defense minister who, who was? Yes, go ahead. Please. Defense minister also was uh, the head of a, a joint security uh, operation. Uh. Who were his top legal advisors? Mango. Don't, don't remember any names. Yeah, I should remember, but I don't know. He has some legal, you know, advisors. He has a legal team. Yeah, can, uh, can you can you say who I, are those I on can, that legal I, team? I'm sorry, I can. Oh no, well, who is this boy? Super Wu uh, was. Uh, one of the legal advisors. Was Mr. Charles Brumskin at any time one of his legal advisors? Who? Mr. Charles Brumskin. Yeah. Brumskin, but later I don't know what happens. Um, Mr. Pierre, Mr. Jimmy, Mr. James A. Pierre Jr.? Uh, they were all friends at Taylor, but later they disappeared. But I don't know. They will explain it better. Now, as a member of the MPFL and MPP, how was the NPP financed? How did they raise the money? Later on, when they transformed into a political party, how did they raise the money for operational activities? I will tell you one thing, and uh, Commissioner Sandra, it's hard to believe. When I became Vice President, what happened was that when uh, President Taylor is having any meeting, that has to do with finance. Um, he will order me as skills. He said, look, a uh, vice president cannot be here and the president is here. So uh, you will hear from me what's uh, been discussed in this meeting. So who were those top people in those financial meetings, those gurus from which you were excluded? But sometimes I will leave before they come and say, look, you have to be aware. sometimes sometimes they came before you left sometimes you left before they came sometimes sometimes they came before you left so who were those that came before you left sometimes well i mean like the finance minister who has the money and uh i think i said that in hague one time the finance minister was dismissed because he was so technical he wanted some paper signed because he has to balance his books and and what now, what now, so, um, Who was that finance minister? Uh, the finance minister is now the Liberian ambassador in, in the United States at that time. He was dismissed? He was dismissed because he was so technical on the president. He wanted everything, a uh, signature, what how about How about the previous uh, finance minister? How about his successor? His successor? His, successor. his, his predecessor, rather. The predecessor was there too, well, because I don't know much about his dealing, because he has become, and what was he? But well, he was less technical, in your view. Yeah, you know, in my view, he never discussed. Well, any financial matter with me was not possible. Well, during the, during the fighting in Monrovia, 2003 or so, there was a huge uh, sum of money that was taken from the, from the central bank. 
and taking the white flower, how much money was it that was taken? And who now, ordered that amount? I heard that the also. Bank? I heard that also, and I saw some of the money. New notes were taken in cartoons and pick up, and they were brought over to white flower, and soldier was taking pay and whatnot. And, uh, but I, uh, I was not involved with it, so it would be difficult for me to say anything about it. You were not well, involved I saw the money, yeah, I was not. Like what, always. Were they, were, they, were they United States in Liberian dollars or only Liberian no, dollars? Or only I, saw, I only saw the Liberian dollars. Only saw Liberian I dollars. won't see the U.S. dollars, sir. Now, when you became president, yeah. how much money did you meet in the national coffers? Ooh, I beg you, I, have, I left this important document for you. There was some money. It was not pretty much. How much I, was it? I had a recover. I was say um, it was only half a million dollars. It wasn't a much money. And this money, one time the legislators, uh, <coughs> under my command as president, were trying to impeach me because they wanted this money withdrew. So I can, you know, pay them off, and uh, so I said, no, I cannot. So the, the there was a heated argument, and they ordered me to be impeached. So I know the procedure. I said, before you impeach me, it will take about a few months. By that time, I'm no more president of this country because my tenure three months, and I'm a lawyer. So we're going to fight it, and they all got weak and left it. But they said that this money must be taken. I said, no. Was it legislators that were calling for that? They were plenty, a lot of the legislators. They want their money taken off, so. Did they because they want their money, they, they're taking their vehicles and all from them, so they said, no. Their money, yeah, Mr. President, we've got to do something. So I said, no, I cannot. They threatened me and threatened me, and I stood firm until today, and the money remained there. Now, you mentioned that there were some of those who got attracted to the MPFL for various reasons. Some of them to get rich. Who can you say are some of those who got rich, who were attracted, who got rich, I would suppose, amassing wealth illegally? Well, well this is also a difficult thing to say. We all are being can see who came out of MPP or MPF and, and are so rich in this country. But... Um, that they were not rich before. They were not rich. Some were just driver or clerk someplace and they are multi millionaire. And and a lot of things went on. I mean So if, if so if we so, so I be, I won't go to court because we gotta calm down a little bit. So, so if, I beg you, uh, Commissioner. So, so so if 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 we can infer from what you're saying that there were those who may have uh, committed in a way should we say economic crimes, would you say that you are absolved from any such? Did you amass wealth illegally? Who, me? Yes. Wait, if I, no, I don't think. I don't think I have been very careful. And uh, my colleagues say I'm a coward, I'm a scary man, and a scary man does not get rich. I got a house. I got two houses. I got one on a farm, and I got a house here in the Soul Clinic area. And I built this house from Libya. When I became ambassador, I went to Gaddafi myself and said, Well, look, uh, Chief, I beg you. The war has broken my house down. My family are in the street. They are, they are nowhere. And uh, please, I don't want them to be in the street. And he said, well, he ordered the ambassador here to come and see what I was talking about. And they gave me a letter to get some cement, some steel rod. They were bringing steel rod from, uh, through the Libyan Holding Company. And they, they were ordered that they gave me some steel rod and some materials to start to build my house. So automatically, it is Libya who assisted me in building my house because I cried and told him that I was very poor. I got nothing. Uh, my, my properties have been destroyed during the war. So uh, I don't think I uh, inquire worth because 
you might not know me very well. I'm a very careful person. Very, very careful. So you did not eat government money? Well, I, 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 I mean to be in a government. I mean, in, not in a legal way, not what is honestly due, but I'm talking about actual legal means. You did not. No, I don't think, I, I don't think I'm, I'm that kind of person. Okay, if we move on. At the time you were a top official in the Taylor government, there were some past officials who were detained at the police station or at the stockade, but they were detained by the Taylor-led government. Some of them were removed from their cells, taken out and executed. Among those was one Colonel Thomas Dewey of the AFL. Who were responsible for ordering the executions? And that, that I wouldn't know. That left purely with the police and the justice ministry. I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. As vice president, uh, I don't think the justice minister will be reporting to me directly. So I think that has to do with the president at the time. So you have no idea? No, no idea at all. I'm sorry. Now, my final question to you. Yeah. Decisions of the MPFL, of the NPP government, of which you were a part, major decisions, minor decisions, they were made by the government. Who were those responsible? Previously, I asked who were 10 most influential in the NPP government. Now I'm asking, major decision making in the MPFL was done in consultation with how many persons and who were those persons? You being one of them, I'm sure. No, that means I would say something. I uh, will let uh, some justifications so you will know how Taylor led government, you know, uh, runs in this country. Charles Taylor was a good president in a sense. But I told you, I told you here in my statement that um, you don't play with his power, his presidential power. And secondly, Sometimes we go to cabinet meetings and he will talk and explain and, and lecture and lecture and say, look, I just called you here to let you know what is happening. But the decision left with me to make, I will make my decision. I'm in the captain chair of this country. Anybody who has served on a Taylor government, you find this all from them. So sometimes he makes a decision. I want them, uh, as uh, I mean, Musa Sese, the late in Burkina Faso, you throw a joke at him. He said, Brian Taylor, you let a run Russian government. You want to do everything you want. And we all laugh. So if you talk about people in power, people he trusted. He was so security minded to get confidence to somebody, even to say, I, the vice president, she knows some things about me. I got some document which is not necessary because it's not linking with this, uh, with the testimony. But you will feel sorry for me. You will say, the thing this man is talking, I don't think he was really a vice president. So, Taylor trusted himself most. So he makes his decision. He decides what to do. And we must follow. If you don't follow, then you are enemy to him. That's the kind of man he is. Now, lastly, I just forgot. At the time he became uh, president, yeah. there was a consignment of iron ore at the port of Buchanan. Yeah. Which I'm sure you are aware of. No. You are not aware? No. So the arrangement for its sale and all of that, you're not aware, you have no idea, you know nothing about no, it? No, no idea. 
what what do I go know about iron ore is that iron was in Bikina and the lands and mines were going there to and I didn't question because it did not reach me so I didn't it was just within that time I turned over and the Judy Bryan government came and and what happened happens I don't know so when you turn over the iron ore was among those assets that you turn over everything government vehicles I turn over the whole country in fact and you don't remember how much was in the national treasury at the time no it was a uh, except later we have a document which i will present to you later thank you very much thank you hmm. testing thank you miss witness for your presentation I would like to start off by just reading a general preamble that I usually speak to most people at this time. <clears throat> to date, we have received 18,000 statements from victims in Liberia and around the world in the TRC. We have visited every county in Liberia and met with hundreds of victims of the Liberian tragedy and listened artistically to their sad stories and painful past. Currently, we are restructuring our inquiry unit to facilitate the final phase of our work prior to our detailed consultation on the way forward for Liberia. It is for this reason that you did not receive prior to coming here today a listing, detailed listing of alleged charges uh, against you for the various victims of the Liberian tragedy. However, we will provide you with this list at a later date. Thank you. Um, it is this TRC process, not our personal choice or thinking, which defines and structures those who will be classified by us as alleged perpetrators, or those who bear the greater burden of responsibility for our national crisis. Yes. But please realize that though we are not a court, we can provide immunity against persecution for anyone that gives full disclosure to us at that time. This is as per the TRC Act Article 10, Section 30. For example, if you had personally or accidentally killed one Mr. John Brown during this period and you did give full disclosure for this act, no court of law in Liberia would be able to trial you for that crime. You would be free. Um, this is the power of our immunity. However, if all alleged perpetrators deny their involvement in atrocities on record with the Commission, then this immunity does not apply. Reconciliation also cannot take place. And thus, we are stuck in a very delicate position of having to recommend another remedy as a means of national justice. Mm -hmm. So my first question is uh, trying to understand your military involvement during the various periods of investigation. We have a period of investigation that started from 1979 to 85. Can you tell us please what was your situation during that period of our history? Were you a simple Liberian citizen sitting somewhere in a country or were you out of the country or were you what, a businessman or what were you doing during that period please? 1979 to 85. Before you went for training to start the MPFL. I know I was, uh, I was in Europe I was in Germany in the Colonnaden Institute of Language, Languages. And I came down after the 1980 coup. And Queen um, Empire has promised me when I said I'm doing language, he will find a job in the embassy in uh, Hamburg. We, uh, Mr. Taylor, but then in that process, when he and Doe had this conflict, and then we all had to flee, and I went to my village, and uh, and we went on to Cote d'Ivoire. Okay, so you went to your village after that 1981 or 82 or what? No, I was there. I was there. no, I was in my village in 83. 83? Yeah, they so were 83. Up, up to 1983, that means from 1980 when you came back and no, was in that was, promise? No, I came back in 1881. In 1881? Yeah. Okay. 
And then from 81 to 83, yeah. you were in town, and that was the time of the promise. Yeah, I was in town, yeah, in Monrovia, oh, okay. in and out of there, in the barracks. We didn't move about, we him freely. Why and were you in the barracks, please? Yeah, no, I'm not, not staying there. Oh. I will go sometimes with our lunch together. Oh, it's in a joint, it's convoy, go to Nimba, and come back. And so until one day, this confusion started. Okay. And uh, trouble was coming, so uh, we all decided to push by a little bit. So, in essence, you went back to Nimba with Kuampa during that time? Yeah, well, when, no, I was not when I went to my home village. But I mean, it was the same purpose because you were close to him and he had to leave, so you felt you had to leave. Ah, uh, well, we did we, for safety, mm -hmm. so we all went to Nimba, yeah. Okay, so then from 83 now to 85, you stayed there in your village? Yes, I went into La Cotiva. You went into La Cotiva, you said? They are in 85. Oh, okay. Why did you have to go there in 85? When this confusion started, killing started, and uh, I told you my, my brother, uh, Major Towa, was beheaded on the beach, and uh, one of my cousins were arrested, and he was handled very roughly. His uh, penis was stretched almost to his knee, and all kinds of things happen. Then we have to leave the town. Okay, so um, concern from '85 with the Kuampa coup. Can I say that you were you in any way involved with the Kuampa coup? No. In the planning of it or the no, supporter the of it or anything? No. no, not at all. I was up. So you were just in your village quietly. Yeah, yeah I was. In, I have just a farm. Heard about uh, it? Yeah, I was on my farm. I'm raising okay. cattle, and I was there. With my goat and sheep and uh, some. Okay. Food. Then in between 85 now and uh, 1991, that's the second period, I have here that you, you, your family were killed somehow, you said, by the, those soldiers in a sense. And yeah. that motivated you to seek yeah. a revenge in a sense. Yeah, right. right. Okay. So yeah. that, that particular incident was a massacre of some sort, right? Can yeah. you describe that massacre for us? What town did it take in and what day did it happen, etc.? Well, and, uh, I have to recollect myself to see okay, that. Take yeah. time. Please. But well, you can't recall it right now. I can't now. recall right now. Yeah. Okay. But could we say that it was 85, it was 86, or 80, what, you know? Because you went for training 85, right? Yeah, it was, it was between 85 and 86. Okay, so. We this thing happened. So we, 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 some things that happened behind, we were just hearing news. They were killing this person, killing that person, and. And uh, we were on our way already to go to Libya. So after that massacre and, of course, the Lutra massacre where your first wife died, yeah. the combination of these things made you feel that you had to take revenge for your family and your people. The first one, killing my brother, almost to say, and a lot of things happened. Okay. Now I'm talking about flocking of people, looting their properties, raping and things to our relatives. I see. That I wouldn't want to mention. Okay. And we were all, even at the asking the time, we refused to speak a Gyo uh, dialect. Mm -hmm. Because if you speak Gyo or Mana, you will be arrested or prosecuted. Mm -hmm. So people were changing their names and before you could pass any checkpoints. Okay. So it was very unbearable to live in your own country and cannot speak your own uh, dialect. I understand. How many years did you go for training in Libya? Were you there from when? From 84 or from 85 until what, 89 when the incursion took place or what? <laughs> no. We, were, we left 85. We went to Libya in 86, 87. And we returned in 89. 89? Yeah. We so from 86 to 89, three yeah. years? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. 86 to 89. Okay. So then from 85 to 86 was more like a turbulent year where you're running away, exactly. trying to find some connection. Who yeah. was the first person that stimulated you to join the MPFL? Who's your, rec who's your recruiter? Who brought you into the organization? Uh, Alfred Men. Alfred Men. Uh, Alfred Men, M-E-H-N. Alfred Men. M-E-H-N. L-E-H-N. Alfred Men. And what was his position at that time? 
Well, he, he didn't have any position I know of. He was a contact person. He he was talking to uh, to Taylor. He was talking to Taylor's wife, and then he would come down to us to talk to us. So in essence, it wasn't Taylor then who was a founder per se of the NPFL idea, but somebody had already previous another group had pre-stimulated the yeah, idea. Yeah. And they was recruiting people. Yeah. And you and Taylor were some of those recruited. So yeah. could you tell us a little bit about this Alfred and where he was getting his inspiration from? Who was behind him? That what I said it was Mr. Stiller, uh, one Agnes Reeves. Or oh, Agnes Reeves. Yeah, who was the wife of Taylor. Oh, so it was Taylor then. So he sent he, he Alfred. Was Taylor, he was sending this, uh, mm -hmm. send this Alfred man to oh, us. I see, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, now you said your, when you came back after the training 89, uh, they, we knew about the incursion in December. So you were not part of that particular group that entered from Ivory Coast. No, I you was. I was. I was in Libya. Okay, so you were I left was, back. I, in yeah, Libya. I was one of the last to remain behind with a special instruction mm -hmm. to make sure that the the weapons to be used during the war being shipped put pressure on the Libyan to give what of a promise to us. So I was in Libya. Okay, so then technically you didn't come to Liberia side until what, 1991 or what? When did you actually yeah. enter Liberian territory? Yeah, I, I came in uh, 1990, but late, late okay. 1990. What yeah. month, please? I came in 1990, it was uh, in June, June or July. So by then the war was well off the ground. The war was, was pro uh, progressing. There were heavy fighting going on. What was on. your first assignment to, for you when you entered the Liberian territory? What were you entering as? You were already at that time the inspector general, or were you another position? No, I was not inspector general. Mm -hmm. I was adjutant general when I came into La Côte d'Ivoire, and I stayed there to bring another consignment of arm and ammunition. I delay. And report came that I given these arms over to uh, Prince Johnson, and I was ordered to come to the base. Upon reaching the base, I was arrested. Okay. Yeah. All right. So uh, you yeah. were coming in now with guns, with your own battalion. Did you have a group yourself? No, I or didn't come with battalion. I came a single person. Oh, no security, nothing. Just one. No man. security. When I was, I was nothing. We are come from Libya to fight. Mm -hmm. That time there was no promotion, no name, nothing. But the key point is you came without even a weapon, you say. You no. You brought weapons, but you didn't have one yourself. You didn't have a pistol on you or a machine gun or something? Nothing. I mean, I, if you didn't, I mean, let me tell maybe you might not follow me closely. Let me tell you how I came in. When I left Libya and came to uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, mm -hmm. it was the time Taylor said, you have to stay here and get some uh, shipment that's supposed to be here for us to ship. But then we didn't have the money to pay for the civilian trucks to transfer these weapons from the gendarmerie's truck to a civilian truck. And I delay. And somebody who has come to check on me went back to Taylor and said... Yeah, I remember that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and said that I have stolen these uh, weapons and given them over to Prince Johnson. I didn't even know that Prince Johnson had been broken away. Okay, I understand that, but what I'm trying to understand is, uh -huh. here's a military operation. A man has been trained. He was yeah. the adjunct general, the head of all of the training facility. Yeah. They have now come onto the ground yeah. to carry out this, the action. This is June 1990, and you come on ground, empty-handed, now one weapon, with a whole consignment of weapons behind you somewhere, and just sitting there with plain clothes, waiting for what? Let me tell you, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, that's you what I'm cannot to take, You cannot take a pen knife into La Côte d'Ivoire. Uh -huh. this, this thing was done on a cover okay. with, the, with the security protection of the Côte d'Ivoire government. Okay. And I dare okay. carry a pistol in La Côte d'Ivoire, I'll be arrested. Okay, Good. that's thing, what I want to understand. Okay, these things came on a proper arrangement and they were crossed over into Liberia. I didn't hold arm until I entered Liberia soil. Okay. That could not be possible in Cote d'Ivoire. I would be arrested. So what was the trail from, Li 
Libya came by air no, into Libya, what country? But this time we are talking about coming from Cote d'Ivoire. No, I mean from the when, from your original assignment in Libya, yeah, you were we in came charge of making air. sure that it came to Liberia. So can you trace for us no, the no, passage no. where you passed we in bringing not, those arms? We, wait, 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 wait. Mm -hmm. When I was coming from Libya, I didn't come with arms. What happened was that I was in Libya when the war started in the, in the eve on the eve of a christmas okay that when the libyan came the foreign week to say that uh, till i have started the war there was not an arrangement but then we are contacting bless campari okay. to give whatsoever he has to send over to to, to charles tiller and by the time i got to wagadugu those things have been sent already to charles tiller by road so I didn't come from Libya with any equipment in a plane. Okay, so then this company from that country yes. sent the dispatchment of arms that you were supposed to bring yeah. ahead of you yeah, they did. to Ivory Coast. The arrangement has been made okay. by the Libyan government while I was already in Libya. Okay. So they asked me to come to make sure what shipment had been sent. Okay. Now from Ragadugu, then I came into Abidjan. Okay. And there's another consignment the arrangement has been made already to follow up. Mm -hmm. And that was the time I delay. And the fellow who came to see after this thing told Tiller on his return that I have taken some of these uh, equipment and transferred them over to Prince Johnson. So that when I was ordered from Abidjan to go to ball play in Liberia, empty handy, I couldn't carry a gun. Because I was crossing the border of Cote d'Ivoire. Okay. And by all my all my arrival mm -hmm. to ball play in the military on the military base, that when I was arrested for questioning that giving these things that supposed to come to us to bring Johnson. Mm -hmm. Then fortunately for me, uh, within two days time while I was in jail, the man who was responsible for this in Abidjan did not see me. That when he called for Taylor to go to Abidjan, mm -hmm. asking for me, that when Taylor told him that I was detained because I had given what I supposed to carry to Prince Johnson. And the man said, No, this is a lie. What Moses Black came for has been given to him and his back here. We are waiting for civilian trucks. But he did not have the money to pay for the trucks. That what happened. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Yeah. So it's a clear combination of two yeah. countries, yeah. Uh, Burkina Faso uh, or uh, Ivory Coast, yeah. their military and their governments and presidents connecting to Libya, bringing the arms exactly. into Liberia exactly. for the purpose. Exactly. All right, that's good. Um, then you finally landed in Liberia now, and that's when your position was instantly changed to Inspector General? Or did, was there a period where you stayed as Adjunct General from 19, let's say uh, June no, 1990? That, that, that that when I became Inspector General, but uh, we in went on, I left, I refused to go back for any other consignment because I was jailed and it was found out later that it was lie and I was in Tapeta when the pickup I was driving in was seized by one of our battalion commanders and their case went before Taylor when it was announced to me that I'm, I'm, I will be called the Inspector General of National Patriotic Front. Okay. So then, at that time now, Mr. Duo was killed in around September, right, of that same year. So the technical no. mission... I think Duo was low. 1990. We're in 1990 now. You entered Liberia, said June, 1990. So... You, you, no, I'm talking about you. You just told us when I asked you, when did you personally come to Liberia? I just typed here, you said around June, right? Yeah, June, June, okay. before June. So, June. and you came because and... We have, we have problem with the dating and, right. and the timing because okay. it has been quite a long time. Okay. So, so I cannot just record, probably and just tell you straight, straight. Okay. So you so, have to pardon me for that. I understand. So within two months now, Do dies. Yeah, right. Okay. So then from the time Do died, oh, I'm trying to understand what, what was this change of strategy because you you told me you were trained because you came for the revenge of this man who had caused a lot of problem for your people now suddenly you got here two months before his death and he's dead but yet now your life takes on another long course of involvement yeah, so was there a period where you struggled where you thought like a 
okay, though it's dead, why am I here? Why don't I change? Or did you just jump in and just keep flowing with the flow? Of oh, no, no. It was not possible for me. I thank God I went to jail, and the war has not ended, even though Doe has died. Mm -hmm. And and uh, I'm connected with a very big group, mm -hmm. and and I don't want to commit suicide and telling people that let me just leave because though I die, I gotta go. Okay. Where am I going? No, I understand. I just want to get that clarity from okay, directly. Good. Okay, so then you join into the flow of history now, and yeah. we move into the next period, 1991 to 1997. Okay, and in this period now, we are told that um, um, MPFL had built up a military machinery up yes. to 70 to 100,000 people. I assume that it happened during this period, 1991 to 1997, because yeah. in 1990, I don't think you had that many people, did you? Yeah, 19. right. We have grown up to that there was 70,000. Then at that time, I was... In 1990? No, not uh -huh. 19,000. It happened gradually, right? Yeah. Okay. Then I have grown, the, the strength I've grown up to almost 7,000. And I was sent to Maryland. I was, my operational area was in Maryland. Okay. As Inspector General. And I later became Superintendent of Maryland. Okay. Thank you. Now I can start with my question. I just want to get an understanding of your different positions. Because then in the third period, from 1997 to 2003, you were president, uh, ambassador to Libya, you were vice president, and then you were finally president. Yeah, right. Okay. okay. All right. So now let's start with the, um, <clears throat> the first one. Um, were the elders of NIMBA ever consulted regarding the participation of the children of NIMBA in this so-called uh, war of revenge against the Crown? Did they ever give their blessings for this, or was this just a decision made by an independent group of Nimbarians? Well, uh, uh, this is a difficult question also. When uh, this, the, the elders of Nimba was, was not involved with this war, and this is a big military operation, some people were all running away into their villages, and I don't think they were they were in the position to advise the commander in chief of the national patriotic front on the war and they didn't even know what was happening all the saw people were fighting and their children were going to war these are young children leaving their parents and coming to join the national patriotic front so i don't, I don't think we have to involve the elders of nimba they didn't know what was going on no, I just asked because I know the, the Nimbarian culture is very close in that sense. And for uh -huh. a large group of people from one particular group to have gotten involved in such a huge uh, process, I uh -huh. thought somehow there would have been some... Re did they re oppose it in any way? Did they try to, to give you advice to get out of this thing or leave it alone? Or, or they just were quiet and they were overruled by the power of the MPFL growing under their feet? Uh, it, it was also a difficult area for them. The people, their farms, their rice were all looted from their kitchen tap. They were suffering. Some people ran into La Côte d'Ivoire in displaced camp. And they were all over. Nobody was there to get decision or to give an advice. Okay. Thank you. Next one. You mentioned that you are a Christian. Yes, I am. But yet, you sought revenge for your people to the point where this nation was destroyed. Hundreds of thousands of our young people were taken out of their homes and turned into uh, killing machines. And with your Christian conscience, how did you live with all of this? I think I have to ask God for forgiveness. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Right. Next. You describe Mr. Taylor as a good and decent man. Did you not? Yes. Okay. Yet history recalls him as a selfish, power-hungry, murderous, deceitful leader who destroyed his nation and brought suffering to its citizens. I didn't, I didn't say all of that. No, I know you didn't. I said history, meaning even I didn't uh -huh, say history. I, didn't, say I, didn't. I just read the newspaper, yeah, read the, the books, yeah. read the, the CNN, listen, you know, just history. When I say history did, yeah. you didn't. I know what you said. Uh -huh, good. Okay. Um, so you just verified what history has told us through testimonies that you gave us. You talk about Sam Bakari, how you told him, and he said, oh, get out of here, that's not your thing. Good. And then you talk about other cases, and yes. all of these cases build up to tell you that this man is not such a good man. But yet, you stayed there. 
because and, that those things has to do with his presidency because uh -huh. it has to do with his power i said also that this is a man you don't play with his power his presidency and you will be right okay so then can we say then that you became a pawn of history a victim of your own circumstances exactly so okay all right do you believe that mr taylor gave the power willingly at the end because there were stories that there was a consignment of arms that should have come and if that consignment had reached God would have had to come to help us because I lived about three blocks from the incident at that Cape time. So what is your thinking? I mean, was this just a patriotic heart of his or was he just squeezed by the international community, the nerd, the model to just give up? Well, uh, the, there's another question to you. Because the, the arms game, they were intercepted and, and there was no way you could fight because there was no arm. And ammunition and uh, Ekuma intercepted, seized the plane in fact and and the soldier could not uh, use their hands to fight so they themselves at the front line was giving up and maybe God wanted it to, to be ended that way and I ended. Yeah, I noticed at the beginning you said God willing in many cases when you talk, uh -huh. and you made it feel like God was <laughs> supporting this war, but at the end it looks like God's real hope was to stop it yes. by seizing those arms and making sure that this country was not totally wiped out from the face of the earth. Okay, next. Um, you talked about 20-something persons that were trained with you in Libya. Well, I don't know, what was the number really? That it was the initial group of highly trained professional terrorist militants. How many were they? Uh, we, I think initially we were 22. Oh, two but originally. We were 22 initially. 23? 22. Okay, thank you. Initially, but the strength grew up to, I will tell you just now. Is it possible we can get the name of those initial 22 persons? No, it's not possible now, I cannot, because I've been a very long time. And I'm not having the records with me. I want to give you the numbers. Could you give it to us later, maybe? Yeah, I'll give you that later. Okay. The, the strength grew up to 156 men. 56. Okay, thank you. Now, there are two operations that I'm very much interested in, but I noticed you didn't give much information on. One is historically called Operation Octopus, you know, 1992. And another one was, was historically called Operation Payday, the April 6, 1996. These two operations were a critical turning point in it's true, the I agree power with you. struggle between the so-called armless Liberians and the armed Liberians. Yeah, I agree so, with you. So, but then I was in the Kipamas. I understand that. But so what I wanted to ask you, because I know you already said that, was could you help, I mean, strategically as from the position you held, could yes. you logically tell us who could we refer to for information? For example, you just gave us one person, one Mr. John T. Richardson, who was the advisor of military yep, or security. No, for national security hmm? or international security national advisor. Security. That in the government now, in government. Okay. What are the names are giving the people working in Taylor's government? Meaning they were not for fighting. Greater Liberia, right? Yeah, so the time Liberia. where we had Greater Liberia between yeah. 1990 and 1990, uh, 90, what, maybe, I don't know, 96? I mean, 96, 97. So there was a separate government at that time. And those were the leaders then. Could they be the ones that could help us with this kind of information on who strategized, planned, funded, and supported these operations? No, we're funding, no, I cannot because I do not know about it. I told you when I became the vice president, financially is not a question with me. The, my president told me that he's, he's the president, he's in charge of that. When there's discussion that has to be finance, I should excuse him, he, I will hear from him. So financially, who was financing what, who was giving what money and what, that left purely with President Taylor himself. Okay, so you have no advice for us in that no. area. Okay, thank you. Next, there was a situation in our history where the government had made a relationship with Taiwan and had changed from China. And then it appears that during your two-month period of presidency, yes. suddenly these cards were shifted. 
there was a situation where even Taiwan had offered a million dollars plus to help Liberian children, the NGO groups. But because of your decision that came at that time, all of that was lost, and I hear China became now the new focal point of relationship with us. So I was just wondering, why was that a necessary decision at that critical time when your power base was going to be so short? Why didn't you just leave that for the end, the next government? Could you shed light on that for us, please? Well, you pressured with, by it yeah, I agree. I agree with you. Mm -hmm. if, 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 if Taiwan has given money for so much, which I think now uh, is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. They have been here long enough to have given what said amount to children and what. Mm -hmm. What happened was that when I became president, I seek advice from foreign leaders okay. of Africa. And they have the experience with China mm -hmm. that the war is on hand. You are just coming from war. The Chinese government will develop your country, even though they are not giving you cash money to be divided. Now, what Taiwan does, you, the people will develop your country, as you can see now for yourself in this country. So when they, they, they kept talking to me, and I accepted the advice. I called the cabinet's uh, meeting and I told the people that, that we have to change from this uh, Taiwanese. I myself as president suspected what the Taiwanese were doing. Other people were just eating, taking the money and sharing it among themselves. So once these people are not bringing in money, they are bringing development to this country, that when I accepted them. Okay, so in essence, prior to that, the president yeah. may have been receiving some of this money, but you had no power to do anything. So now Providence had given you a chance to make a noble change, and you took that chance. Oh, no, I don't understand you, so. No, you I'm just saying, you, you mentioned about the money that was coming in from Taiwan, blah, 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 and how people were taking it, eating it, and enjoying it. But now when you came in, you saw the need to make a noble change for yes. history. And to bring in a country that would help this country without giving any under-table kickbacks to anybody. Good. Okay. Good. You also mentioned about legal fees that you've had to pay recently. $40,000, $50,000. To us, the average Liberian, that's a huge amount of money. I mean, how did you get such wealth during, this, uh, during your uh, short term of presidency or prior to that? Because I know Liberian salaries are so small for presidents. The, the legal fee for what? You said you have legal fees. Recently, you had to pay of forty thousand dollars, right? And another one that's coming up that maybe fifty thousand. Or did I misunderstand you? Sorry. No, uh -huh. I never mentioned about any legal fees. At the beginning, you mentioned something about being having to be sent to court by one situation you made, and it's costing you a lot of legal no, fees. No, 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 no. So you're well, not in you're not in court what, now. What, what legal? Are you in court now? And you didn't have to pay any legal fees for those. No, lawyers? I paid this money. How much was that again? I said it cost me almost twenty thousand dollars already. Oh, twenty. Twenty thousand oh, dollars already. Okay, I see. To and pay lawyers to defend mm -hmm. me in a court. Okay. Against uh, Ben Yuri. Against oh, Mr. Yuri. Okay. He the one okay. took me to court because I testified. That why I say I have a concern. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting here tomorrow. Uh, I'm hoping that I'm not going to court tomorrow mm -hmm. to hire a lawyer because I have no more money. Yeah, okay. That's what I said. Okay, thank you. I just want to understand that. Okay, another strange question. I mean, again, most of you who were trained in uh, this country, Libya, the 21 people that grew into 156, did most of them have a life like you had where all the training went into no vein because you didn't fight? Or you were the only one who was special? that never fought after all of this training? No, I, I, I would like to fight. Now now I was in fighting, but my position would not allow me to fight. I was Inspector General. I was not a foot soldier to go to fight. But okay. if, I, if I was some commander or platoon leader or battalion commander, I could fight. Mm. Okay, but it's the law of the military. I have, I have a job to do. My job would not allow me to go to fight in the butchers. Or say an ambush someplace. Okay, so no, no, I, know to, I want to train to fight. You were the only one then in, in that case that got no, out there, that. There were other people who had oh, bigger who position. Who else, for example, was in your situation where they were trained with you, but
but they just became a position that required them not to even bother with no them. like i told you african men Alfred the man, man. The, the word african man who took me to training he was he was he was he was a big aid to president taylor because for the job he has done to recruit us and we came back we have been recruited by him and then such a man he cannot go to fight he cannot set an ambush to go fight he okay. has done his work already it was not they were not moses Bly alone okay there are other people with higher positions mm -hmm. and they couldn't go to set ambush yeah. that one was left with foot soldiers okay yeah but you were still part of the high command of course yes okay. Um, as Inspector General, considering the huge crimes that were committed by MPFL and the fact that Taylor had direct control over the various commanders, I mean, I think this is what you told us, right? That all of these different groups, they reported directly to one man, Taylor. Yes, yeah, you don't okay. think that. You even mentioned some of them. Let me just review. You talked about the Strike Force, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Wild Geese, the Marine, the SSS, the Executive Mansion Guard, the Artillery Unit, ATU, and you said you didn't know about Death Squad, so I'll keep that one out. So no, all no, of these, no, these kind of groups, they all reported directly to Mr. Taylor. Exactly. Okay, so it means that uh, they each must have had some kind of commando, right? Some head. That would of carry course, they, they have the heads. Okay. Do you they know the, the names of these no, commandos? No, I, 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 I don't know. But they have their heads and they report directly to their chiefs. But well, what I'm saying is you an inspector general. If you are to be responsible to secure no, what they call no, uh, that, safety and information flow of the staff let, and all of these different things, how can you not know anything? Let me, let me tell you one thing. Mm -hmm. I said it here clearly from my initial statements. Mm -hmm. When you are Inspector General, have a limitation. Anything that has to do with executive mansion, the artillery unit, the, the, the Marines, they are strictly under the executive mansion. Oh, so it's not, it's just the artillery and the Marines? No, not just the artillery and Marines. How about the Navy, the Army? The Navy, they all under Strike the executive mansion. So in essence, the whole military machinery was directly, directly under Taylor. So yes. what were you Inspector General for? I mean, you had nothing to control. To be they they have over. other battalions that were outside of, 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 of the Zedo Mansion control area. Oh, so besides these major forces, yes, there were other, other battalions. People, yeah, there are other people fighting. Could you tell us about those, please? For different areas. Who were some of those yes, other battalions, please? I want to go in the bathroom, please.